What is the scariest oh heck no experience you've had? I work for a food delivery service and on one delivery I had to go about 2 miles down a one way road at about 10.30pm. There were banks on both sides so if I wanted to leave and another car came down the road I wouldn't be able to get out and would have to reverse backwards to a driveway. Houses around were pretty scattered and everyone's driveways were at least 100 yards from the houses. I took notice of this driving in because I'm a woman and had my guard up. I get to the address which is an abandoned home with no lights and the driveway is blocked off with boards and immediately the hair on the back of my neck stood up. It was a dead end and the nearest house was about 700-800 yards away. I parked and locked my doors and called the customer and they said they were in the trailer across the street and they would come out to meet me. There was no trailer across the street at all, but this dude came off of a dirt trail and started walking up to my car. As they were coming towards me the guy asked if I could wait about 5 minutes for his friend to come back with a tip for me. The bill was already paid, and I politely declined saying that I had to go back to work out of being scared. He then got a phone call and his literal words were yeah bruh, can we make this happen? Are you on the road or what? I put the food on the ground said goodbye and booked it out of there so quick you could probably see dust behind me. That incident taught me to always trust my gut and to never worry about the tip. I could have just been extremely paranoid but I feel like I got lucky that time. Always trust your gut. Better safe than sorry and all that. But his friend was probably bringing weed. LOL. When I was 10 or so, I woke up before everyone in the house. It was like 7am and decided I would sneak into the pool. I was waist deep in the water before I saw the alligator on the other side of the pool. I've posted this before somewhere but I used to work the night shift all the time, and basically shifted my whole sleep schedule over to that, wake up 7pm every day day. It was fine save for the fact that every now and then I'd have to do my grocery shopping at like 10pm, which wouldn't be so bad if I also didn't have epilspy which means I can't legally drive, so I bike everywhere, usually listening to podcasts on the way. One day I was on my way home from shopping and got to my driveway. It was one of those super long rural driveways that so many creepy pasta people will go into a long 4 page long description of how creepy it is. It wasn't creepy, really, just secluded. Anyway, it's a long drive through the woods and I'm used to all kinds of animals jumping out and running by as I'm going down the road. But this day something felt off. I saw an animal jump out into the middle of the drive and I just stopped waiting for it to scurry off. I honestly thought it was a deer, because they're stupid and everywhere. But then my lights caught the eye shine and I realized it was way I, 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 I too low to be a deer. My next thought was, oh great it's one of the coyotes that we keep seeing in the backyard. I unplugged my headphones and turned my music up as loud as it'll go. I had a Lumia 635, which had a loud as freak speaker. I started stomping my feet and trying to scare the dumb coyote out. I was shining my lights out on it. It just stood there, staring at me, and then it got low to the ground. Low to the ground and sulked towards me. I realized immediately this was not a deer or coyote or even a near hood dog escaped. It was a freaking mountain lion that was now slowly approaching me. I backed my way out of the driveway, making sure not to lose eye contact with the animal, and then busted my butt down the hill to my job. Only place open at that hour within immediate biking distance. I wasn't 100% certain it was a mountain lion at seeing it skulk. I just knew it was not any of the animals I'm used to seeing at that it was acting aggressive defensive towards me being there. The only reason I know it was a mountain lion was as I turned the corner on the top of the hill. I tilted my head to make sure nothing was following me to see another, maybe the same one sitting on a rock wall literally 4 feet away from me. It normally takes me 30 minutes to get to work. It took me only 10 minutes that day. Early one morning I was leaving a hotel and a man followed me to my car. I jumped in quickly and locked the doors as my butt was hitting the seat. He knocked on my window and I let it down only about 2 inches. He tried his best to convince me I dropped a key in the parking lot and should get out and get it. It was a ploy and I knew it. I finally looked him in the eye and said, no, not me. He knew I meant that he wasn't getting me. I wasn't scared, but instead furious. 
I left before he did and hurried to get onto the interstate. With heavy 5 lane traffic he came flying up behind me and then right before slamming into me he darted left between cars, almost causing an accident. I couldn't report him because I left so quickly and didn't get his plate number. I never stayed at that hotel again while traveling that route. That's terrifying. I'm about to travel by myself. After reading this, I have to go buy some pepper spray. Anyone who has some recommendations they'd like to share, I'd appreciate it. I was home alone one day and heard someone walking on the roof. I literally almost crapped my pants. Found out later that the roofers were coming that afternoon. Mum forgot to tell me. I hear that sound all the time. At first I was worried, then I was puzzled. I eventually realized it's birds. They make a big thud when they land, just as loud as a person's footfall. Worked at a coffee shop, one of the baristas was cleaning the bathroom. Hear her literally yell, yep she comes to get me, saying I need to take care of a weird looking spider. I love bugs, and get kind of excited to catch and release the weird looking spider outside. Walk into the bathroom and it's not a spider, it's a freaking scorpion. I can take care of the spiders, but not the long tail pinchy ones. I was around 11-12, in a public restroom that had a couple stalls. Just sat down to start my pedal when the woman in the next stall asked if I could pass her some toilet paper. Sure, no problem, we've all been there. When I pass it under the divider, she ended up stroking my finger as she's taking the paper. Her index finger lingering on me. I didn't think anything of it, it's an awkward pass. I finish up, flush and step out of the stall to go wash my hands. As I'm starting scrubbing, she steps out of her stall. Normal looking 40ish woman, just looks like someone's mom. She starts washing her hands and just locks eyes with me in the mirror. It was only about 3 seconds in total, but I remember how her smile subtly went from generic to something a little darker. It was hard to explain, but I felt like she wanted to eat me. Every possible spot of skin that could get goosebumped stood to attention. Instinct told me to GTFO of that bathroom so I bolted. Could have been nothing, could have been a childish dramatic projection, but I swear that bee was going to chew on me. I'm totally getting a witch. Roll doll style. Vibe from your story. I stepped into an elevator on the 8th floor of the hotel and hit the 10th floor button. Right before the doors closed a group of at least 15 people jammed themselves in while I'm standing in the back corner. The elevator was rated for 10 adults. Instead of going up, the elevator slowly started to go down. After half a floor, the elevator went into free fall for roughly 2 floors until the emergency cable caught. I thought I was going to die that day. Room for one more honey. A car accident in my early 20s. I was driving around a bend under a freeway on my last lesson before going for my probationary license when a car driving at least 70 km per hour over the limit, 160 km per hour in a 90 km per hour zone, about 100 miles per hour in a 55 zone, smashed into my rear driver's side. The car I was driving spun out of control and smashed into an underpass. My teacher and I were both desperately lucky to be alive though we both sustained serious injuries. Well did you get your probationary license? I was in the a very very ill from pneumonia. Think 4 staff in the cubicle with me the entire time for about an hour while they diagnosed what was wrong with me. I originally went to urgent care and sat in the waiting room for 45 minutes in the moment they tridged me. They sent me to the air. Anyway, after about an hour and a max of 10 people in working on me at once, I had an IV in each arm and everyone left. I was completely alone, still going in and out of consciousness because of low O2 sat. Whoops, turns out I'm allergic to one of the antibiotics. By the time I noticed, my hands and wrists were too swollen to hit the call nurse button and so I was just flailing my sausage arms at the equipment as hard as I could. Not very, until someone came to check on me. It took the staff maybe 30s to figure out what was wrong with me once they came in, but it was some of the longest 30s of my life because I couldn't communicate with them and I had come out of the frying pan and into the fire. At least I knew it was anaphylaxis and wasn't just suddenly dying from. Yikes, you were very lucky. I did community service at the local hospital. One of my duties were to deliver the food menus early morning to every patient so that meant starting my rounds around 5-6am. 
The first floor was Iku and it was still fairly dark around that time. I walked into a patient's room and all the blinds were shut and the only light that lit the room came from the equipment she was hooked up to. I wasn't sure if she was awake or not and so I announced myself and waited for a response. Sometimes patients were unable to make meal choices and so I would stick around to help them out. I stood there for a couple seconds and saw her eyes closed shut. Thinking she was still asleep, I made my way towards the door. Halfway through, with my back towards her, I hear her say, make sure they don't follow you out. I stopped in my tracks and slowly turned around and saw that her eyes were still closed and quickly ran the frick out of there. There was no one in that room except her. I bet she laughed her butt off after you left. Trekking through the woods behind my friend's house while playing manhunt. Midnight in December. No sensible reason for anyone to be outside. Snow everywhere. I'm walking along and approach this ramshackle cabin crack house. Hear a faint squeaking of a swing set moving back and forth. Audibly to my friend, who was with me, I say, what the frick is that? Dead. Fricking. Silence ensues. The swing stops moving the minute I stop talking. I'm not known for my running but I think I broke land speed records that day. When I was about 10 years old, we'd been on holiday and I'd spent every day going down to the local pool. There was a friendly lifeguard there, probably early 20s and maybe a little too friendly to a 10 year old, often commenting on how I looked in my bathing suit, etc. Me and my friend were super innocent and just thought he was nice but a bit weird. Anyway it got to the last day of the holidays and he knew I was leaving. The pool was busy and I was playing at the deep end. All of a sudden there was a big splash and the lifeguard's face popped up right beside me. Really close. I remember it so clearly. He smiled at me and said it's time. I just yelped and got the frick out of the pool and ran away. Literally never to return again. I don't know what he meant by it's time but some instinctive part of me knew this was wrong. It wasn't until years later I saw just how sinister and gross that was. I'm so glad I ran. Got into a car with a friend, did not realize she was very high until she almost killed us blowing through a red light, made her pull the frick over and I drove us home suspended license or not I was not ready to die like that. Last week when I started the BBQ, went inside to grab the things, and came back out to see the entire grill and top of the tank entirely engulfed in flames. Apparently we had a leak we didn't notice. I managed to throw water on the tank and cut the flames ASAP so thankfully no real damage but I think I'm done BB Ching for the year. Just put a fire extinguisher next to the grill before you start it. Don't use water. I just recently moved out of the north. Where I lived in particular happened to be a very tick infested place some seasons. Well one day I pulled a huge one off my dog, grabbed an old shoe and flattened that bugger. When I lifted up the shoe I noticed a good amount of blood moving all strange like. Upon closer investigation it turned out to be little microscopic babies moving around. It gave me the most oh heck no feeling I've probably had. I ended up torching the concrete for like a minute straight. Took care of the situation quite well. Reminds me of the time I stepped on a spider as a kid, and a million babies ran in all directions when I lifted my foot. I've never killed another spider in my life. I was riding the train after a soccer game with my brother and his wife and was standing in a compartment. A very visibly audibly intoxicated woman was sitting on the floor by herself. She complimented my shoes, not expensive shoes, and was slurring every word. I told her they were from Nordstrom's on sale as a joke, and turned away from said drunk woman. A man was standing nearby and lifted his shoe up and said, what about mine to which people chuckled. I thought he was just going for a joke but he kept watching her. Once we got to a stop and it was called over the intercom, she got up to leave. The man looked left, then right, and then got off train with her. I practice social work and have worked in victims advocacy for some time. This was every bad vibe I needed. I said, oh heck no and got off at this stop, way ahead of my actual stop. My sister-in-law pushed my brother onto the platform and they both followed me, unsure as to why I left the train. The man was 20 feet ahead with his arm around this woman as she stumbled along the platform. I walked up and said, I just have to let you know, you are acting exactly like a predator and are giving off a lot of red flags. He went on to explain his innocence, that he has daughter her age, 
and that, and I quote, I wish someone would be this protective of my daughter. We separated the two. My sister-in-law was walking with the woman and supporting her from falling. My brother and I kindly escorted the man away. When we met back up, the woman had flagged down a driver in the parking lot that she said was her boyfriend. She got in the car and rode off. I am pretty certain we prevented a sexual assault that day. Was out wading with my cast net to catch some mullet for fishing. As I was out there a group of bobcats had congregated around my bucket of bait as some jumped out and they were eating them. I stayed out there for a good hour and they knocked over my bucket and ate all the mullet I already caught. Poor babies were hungry and you ever so nicely left them an easy access bucket of fish. How good of you sir. When I was in Mexico, I was staying on a decent sized resort with a good amount of wildlife. When we first arrived, an employee warned us about the possibly aggressive wildlife, spider monkeys, lizards, fish, etc, on the trails and in the waters. These trails had cenotes, gardens, historical pieces and a bunch of other cool stuff. I wanted to see a pre-hispanic oven offered as a historical piece. So I walk down a dirt road in the furthest corner of the resort, resort is about 6-7 square miles, to see this oven. On my way out, at least 30 of these freaking lizards were lined up making all sorts of sounds at me, with their necks all flared up and crap. Also, at the resort they told us to stay on the trails, because of other potentially dangerous wildlife. But I was cornered by 30 of these freaking things in nothing but wet shorts and sandals. How do you prepare someone for a situation like that? I said frick the trails and I ran through those woods faster than I have ever ran before. Not quite sure what those lil guys wanted from me. They wanted to frick you. Male lizards blow up their throat neck for the same reason that male birds show off their bright and beautiful feathers. To attract a mate. You were about to get gangbanged by 30 lizards. I was around 8 on vacation at a beach. Me and my brother were having a lot of fun, but near sunset my dad just yells at us to get out of the water and run for the little apartment we were staying at. We asked him why and he just said one thing. Horseflies. Cut to one minute later where all of us are just running as fast as we could dodging these giant evil bug pieces of crap while they just made huge buzzing sounds and tried to rip our flesh off. My little 8 year old brain probably made it extra dramatic but dang those things are terrifying. Those dang things are no joke. They don't bite, they punch a hole and slurp out your insides. Was watching TV, sitting on my couch when I saw the silhouettes of 3 me, one with a gun drawn. Walking up to my door, they knocked on my door, I didn't respond and sat there with my crappy little shotgun, they started knocking loudly, I guess to make sure if anyone was home, then they started to pry open the door with a crowbar, I called the police, but by the time they arrived, the dudes were gone, the men who were trying to break in were standing next to a broken window the entire time, thank goodness you didn't have to end up shooting one of your clones. I lived in an old Saddam bunker while in Iraq. We were using it as a patrol base. The lowest level had almost completely filled with water. About 20 feet from the landing was a camp toilet we installed, so we wouldn't have to put on body armor to go to the bathroom. Well, it's about 3 in the morning, I'm half asleep because I had to answer nature's call and use this stupid toilet. My flashlight died while I was in there and I could hear water dripping from the ceiling of that flooded floor. I know now there wasn't anything to worry about, and I knew I needed to change the dang batteries. But at that moment I was scared shitless and that became one of the fastest bathroom breaks I've ever had. Imagine drowning in a bathroom in the dark. That's some nightmare fuel. A little bit different than what's been posted so far, but frick it. I got involved with someone who turned out to have a history of domestic violence. When he told me about it, he said his ex knew how to push his buttons, and he smacked her after a bad day at work. Later, he said he tried committing suicide, because he didn't want to be like his super abusive father. Fast forward in he and his ex's relationship and she eventually left with a moving truck while he was at work. Which he called her a C for and tried to sue her for some stuff she supposedly took and her half of and paid rent due for bailing on their lease. He hasn't hit me, but things got emotionally abusive to the point I don't use the term gaslighting as lightly anymore. Since he did it often enough that I was beginning to question my own sanity, I blocked his phone and got in touch with his ex. 
basically asked her how she managed to get away from him and keep it that way. We chatted a bit. Turns out she filed two police reports. One when he hit her, and another for fear on attempts on her life because he was planning to kill her. She said nothing about his suicide which, going by what he told me, they were still living together when he made that attempt. After we chatted, I had a dental appointment I needed to go to. The news on the waiting room's TV was reporting on how often abusees of domestic violence are murdered by their abuser. Unfortunately, dude knows where I live and work. I've thought about getting a restraining order, but it might get him fired if it's granted. In that case, he might think I'm the reason why he was fired depending on what he's told, which would make things a lot worse. Make a paper trail with the police and with your workplace. If you do decide to file an RO, this will make it easier. I was 4 years old and I lived with my grandparents at the time. My grandparents house was not fully developed and bugs and spiders would come in the showers and kitchen. When I was finished doing my business in the bathroom, I tried to go back outside again but there was huge snake in the kitchen so I couldn't get past. All I was doing was screaming until someone heard me. Worked in a large store, there was a guy that had been hanging around my department. He was there quite frequently. I remembered him because he was always wearing the same baby blue basketball shorts. He never talked to me. I would just notice him pass through. We had registers in our department. I walk from one side of the department to the register. And when I get to the register, I notice this guy go past me on my right. Two co-workers at the register had this look on their face. They said he was right behind me. Like his face and my hair right behind me. I had no clue. There was someone that close to me, and I never knew it. Normally, I'm pretty aware of my surroundings, but the fact that that guy got so close to me and I didn't have a clue creeped me out. A week or so later, he was on the opposite side of an aisle, where my department manager caught him beating his meat, in the middle of a busy store. Apparently, I was the reason he had been hanging around our department. I had a stalker and didn't even know it. Obviously, he was arrested for jerking it in public. I only saw him once after that. I saw him walking down the highway a few weeks later, still in the baby blue basketball shorts. Never saw him after that. Thank god. I think he may have been homeless. Comma never saw him after that. Thank god. Doesn't mean he doesn't see you. I went to get one of my pals to study for an exam saw him having sex with his stepsister in something like a fursuit. The worst thing I haven't told him yet that I know. So me and my cousin both have a love for all things horror movie and paranormal related stuff. Well at the time he lived in Hillywood's Valdosta, Georgia in a two story house with his dad, my uncle, his mom and younger sister and brother. Well we stopped there to caravan with them on our way to family reunion in Dauphin, Alabama. But frick nowhere. Well the night we got in me and my cousin started sharing all the paranormal and horror related stuff we had learned since we had seen each other last. Well eventually we ended up in his attic den room which is the only room on the second floor. It's carpeted and has a chair, a computer, daybed, TV and my cousin's game systems. But it also has four different recessed movable panels that when moved hide what are essentially storage spaces. Well this visit was the first time I ever moved one of the panels to see what was behind it. That night me and my cuz convinced my aunt to use her credit card to pay to watch a horror movie on his 360 in the attic room. This is unrelated but the movie was a Spanish horror movie I believe, and featured a family that moved into a house with a maze in the backyard with a well at the center. I don't remember much else if you know it please tell me. Well we finished the movie probably around 230 in the morning and were tired and decided to sleep in the attic room. We made ourselves comfortable for sleep and my cuz turned the TV over to some show about Alaska, while I tried to sleep on the daybed. Well a few minutes go by and all of a sudden we heard a sound like someone had taken a deep, long, rattly and raspy human breath. And the breath noise came from the area behind the daybed. And the daybed sits against the upper part of the wall of the attic room with two of those four storage rooms behind it. Once I heard it my cuz slowly turned to me, with a look on his face like he had shat his pantaloons, to ask if I had heard the noise too. I had. We didn't get much sleep after that. We still talk about it to this day because there are nowhere vents or anything in that attic room that could have made that noise. It still sends a shiver down my spine. 
I was staying alone in a hotel room in advance of a friend's wedding. It was my first time traveling alone and since the wedding was in San Jose and I live in LA so I was about 8 hours from home to add to it. Around 2am I hear someone trying to use a key in my door and pounding on it frantically to try to get in. That was a really huge oh heck no moment for me. Luckily enough for me I had experience working in a hotel that was a little too free with their master key so I'd engage the deadbolt on my door whenever I was in it. I was so glad for that deadbolt that night. Good thinking on the deadbolt. I always use them. 2. Stayed in a hotel one time, where they had an issue with the locks engaging. If the door wasn't pulled all the way shut, someone figured this out, and would come in and rob the room, occasionally with people sleeping inside. I have to. The first happened when I was in kindergarten. I used to walk to school with some of the other kids in the neighborhood. We literally lived less than a block from the school. One day I had to walk by myself because the other two kids were on vacation or sick or something. Either way, I'm walking home, and a man pulls up beside me and starts driving real slow along with me asking me to get in, that he would give me a ride. Ect. Kept telling him no, I was fine. I lived right there, my parents were expecting me. He didn't leave me alone until I made it to my neighborhood and I booked it from there to my house. Major stranger danger vibes. I still remember how he made me feel very scared and not at all like a good citizen trying to help a small child walking alone. The second was when I was 16. My mother and I had a flat tire on the interstate and no jack. This was pre-cell phone days mind you. So we're sitting on the side on the interstate, hoping someone will see our flashes and pull over to help us. A car pulled over in front of us and a man got out of the car and started walking to us. Never said hello, never smiled, never indicated in any way that he was friendly. He had a buck knife on his belt. If you're from the south, or do any hunting you know what this is. And as he got close to us, his hand went to that knife and he flipped the holster strap open. About that time a jeep full of teenage boys stopped right in between us and him. The boys piled out, helped us with the tire and that guy turned around and left without ever saying a word. If you're reading this, you can drive on a flat tire. Don't end up in bad situations. Cars are easily replaceable. Use it until it won't move anymore. What is the scariest creepiest theory you know about? Okay this one is rough so please bear with me. So the common time travel question is would you go back and kill baby Hitler? Well imagine if that was you. To us in the current timeline you would be a hero that killed someone truly evil before they had chance to corrupt or endanger anyone but to the people of that time you are a monster. A baby killer. They couldn't exactly explain to people. I was sent from the future to kill this baby to save hundreds of millions of lives. No one would believe him and would just assume he was some nutcase. Or maybe they're not allowed to tell anyone as per the agreement with the future government? It makes you wonder all the people through time that have been called monsters for killing babies. What if they were just heroes from the future saving us all? They couldn't tell anyone either? This isn't a theory, but I just think it's cool. You know how movies and shows always have this ancient alien race that came way before us. And we're the new species? Well technically, most likely that's wrong. We are near the beginning of the universe. If the universe was a person, we would literally barely be a cell, not even formed. In reality, we are the ancient species, we are the ones that come before, we are the ones some future civilization may see. Just a crazy thing to think about. Dang, in my mind, we're at the pinnacle of development. I guess the reality is we are far from that. Can't imagine how different life will be thousands of years later. Can't even comprehend the fact that I will be long forgotten by then. I have a sleep disorder that causes nightmares and dreams that are often indistinguishable from reality. I live whole lives with partners and kids or work jobs in strange places for decades and full technical details and reach old age before waking. Sometimes it's so intense that I sob and grieve for the lost relationships as if my real life partner has died. I am confused to be my own age and be here, now. The theory that this life is a dream simulation type thing feels pretty real to me. My brain seems to create whole viable realities anyway. Not much of a theory, more of a conjecture but, fossilization is actually quite rare. It takes extremely specific set of circumstances for a dead organism to even become fossilized let alone survive intact to the modern day to be found by humans. Because of this, 
There are likely millions of species we will simply never know about because none of them ever fossilized. For all we know, we might not even be the first intelligent species to evolve here on Earth. There could have been a species that formed a civilization at some point and then went extinct later on. But we'll possibly never know that because there are no fossils that formed survive today. It probably wouldn't have been an advanced, industrialized civilization like the kind we have today as we would have surely found evidence for it by now. But I could easily see something on par with ancient Egypt disappear completely after millions of years. Any type of human trafficking. Poor young kids, vulnerable women trafficked for sex, kept in cages, in tiny apartments without beds or any amenities, many forcibly hooked on drugs to keep them compliant and dependent on their owners, forced into terrify sexual encounters, barely fed or clothed. In places like Dubai there are tens of thousands of Asian manual laborers who are essentially slaves who have their passports removed forced to live in severely overcrowded apartments, with upwards of 30 plus men sharing a one bedroom shoebox apartment, no access to medical care, not access to legal support, paid barely enough to feed themselves, who went into Dubai on short term contracts to provide for their families, but unable to get home, they then lapse the legal period of their visas and contracts, which means if they go to the police to try and leave back home, they face steep fines and jail time for overstaying, which serves as a deterrent to them reaching out for help. Any of those scenarios is purely awful and terrifying to me. The Valer Incident September 1979 A US Valer satellite detected a double flash of light over an area of the ocean between South Africa and Antarctica. The prior 41 double flashes observed by the satellite were from nuclear explosions as this is what they were designed to observe. There also happened to be a typhoon happening in the area at the time so it seemed like someone wanted to detonate it without being caught. Carter administration reported that it was a natural occurrence due to a small meteorite hitting the satellite. However many other independent sources and even other countries have reported that they did indeed find traces of fallout and radiation. Because of the geopolitical climate of the times, there's very strong evidence that it was in fact a joint nuclear weapon test carried out by South Africa and Israel, and the US scrubbed the information regarding it because they didn't want to paint their allies in Israel in a bad light for working with apartheid-era South Africa. Strangely enough, Israel and South Africa have never denied having nuclear weapons programs, nor have they ever denied a joint test being responsible for the Valer incident. Israel's nuclear program is really shady, but I don't want to wake up with two gunshot wounds in the back of my head, so I will leave it at that. The last neuron in the brain can fire up to 72 hours after clinical death. What is classed as still being alive? Your heart stops or your brain activity stopping? As a nurse this plays on my mind. I always talk to the recently deceased as I would do usually. Hearing is the last sense to go anyway so chances of people can still hear for a short time after death. I have to confirm death on a daily basis. We check heart sounds, breathing, eye response and pain response. But part of me knows that electrical activity is still going on in there. I'm a hospice nurse and morbid thoughts are what I do best. The man from Tord. He was going through an airport and when asked for his passport he gave the people a fully legitimate passport except the country he was from didn't exist. He argued that it was right between France and Spain and had been there over 200 years. Since the passport was legitimate but the country wasn't on the map they put him up in a hotel for the night with guards outside his 4 story room. He was gone, along with all his things the next morning. Not a trace. I also heard that he had Japanese stamps in his passport that looked legitimate and when they showed him a map to identify his country he started freaking out when it wasn't there. Some smart people I know say life extension tech will exponentially explode in the next century, transforming adult lifespans the same way antibiotics, vaccines, and sanitation irrevocably transform childhood survival rates. If we hadn't blocked stem cell research, we could be the ones living youthful nearly disease-free lives but we've missed our chance by one or two generations. If the human body senses trauma it is unable to combat, it will switch off metabolism, pump endorphins, and slip into a pain-free dissociative state. In essence, shutting down. It's been seen in air crashes and lots of places really. Basically your body can switch itself off. 
During the Challenger accident from 1986, whenever the shuttle exploded, the ground crews had the astronauts' EKGs and vital scans. After the explosion, the astronauts were still alive. Theory has it that they were cognizant the entire time until they crashed in the ocean. This is what actually happened. NASA never wanted to admit that the astronauts didn't die in the explosion. But there is a major probability that they were not conscious when they crashed into the ocean. The Dark Forest Theory This explains the Freemi Paradox, why we haven't seen any other advanced life forms despite the vastness of the universe. The other advanced life forms don't send out signals into the rest of the universe because they're worried that something more advanced and dangerous is going to find them first. There's another idea that other civilizations know there's something out there but don't send any signals because it has no reason to not wipe out the entire planet. There's a science fiction book based on this and I think this quote explains it better than I can. The universe is a dark forest. Every civilization is an armed hunter stalking through the trees like a ghost, gently pushing aside branches that block the path and trying to tread without sound. Even breathing is done with care. The hunter has to be careful, because everywhere in the forest are stealthy hunters like him. If he finds another life, another hunter, angel, or a demon, a delicate infant a tottering old man, a fairy or demigod, there's only one thing he can do, open fire and eliminate them. Our Dumbass is sent out a golden recording of Johnny B. Good blasting through space. Cosmology can be disturbing. For instance, I recently learned of dead end trips. There are some destinations that you shouldn't try for. It's possible to travel so far away from where you started, that the expansion of the universe will exceed the speed you were traveling at. You can't return home, because home is receding faster than you can travel. You can't reach your destination, because it too is receding faster than you can travel. You can no longer get anywhere, only get further away from everything. You cannot reach any destination, even if you travel forever. A lot of comments bringing up the Femi paradox to explain the lack of evidence of extraterrestrial life, when by all accounts we should be seeing alien life all over the universe. Here's another, unsettling, explanation. If you're scuba diving above a coral reef, and you know that there should be fish all around you, but you don't see any, it's most likely that they have learned that for some reason it's important not to be seen, and since you're a newcomer to this environment, chances are it's not you they're hiding from. Frick that and my ability to sleep tonight. Basically heat exchange theory, that one day all of the heat we use in order to create energy will be expended and the universe will be stuck in a heat lock. I mean it's the heat death of the universe, it's not really a theory, more just something that's straight up going to happen, just a really long time from now. Philosophical zombies, theory that a good portion of the human race lack conscious experience. If you've ever dissociated or done something and don't recall, driven home but have no recollection, your brain acting on autopilot, that's what they're like. They do everything required to be human. They ape emotions, go through life, they just lack sentience. The theory that scented candles starting getting poorer views at the same time COVID hit the US makes you wonder how many people have mild COVID before we even knew about it. Pairing the lack of taste and or smell as one of the main symptoms associated with mild covid cases. Sometimes I'll encounter random strangers that I get a strange vibe from, like they're noticing me more. It's made me think, what if there are time traveling tourists just walking around, and I'm someone important and they want to meet me before I do whatever it is I'm going to do? This is great haha. Paradoxical undressing. A phenomenon frequently seen in cases of lethal hypothermia. Shortly before death, the person will remove all their clothes, as if they were burning up, when in fact they are freezing. Because of this, people who have frozen to death are often found naked and are misidentified as victims of a violent crime. But wait, it gets even weirder. Once they've undressed, the dying person will frequently try to crawl into a small, enclosed space. For which reason, victims of hypothermia are often found naked, squeezed into cupboards or beneath beds. This is called terminal burrowing behavior. All sense of reality seems to fade. Sounds like the behavior of a wild animal. Yeah I was told once that when hypothermia kicks in you start feeling really warm cause that's the feelings of your organs shutting down. 
I saw the video about the theory of grey goop, in which one day we invent micro robots used to break down waste, but could somehow evolve to consume all carbon based organic matter. This would eventually lead to them consuming all life on earth. I was mildly freaked out by the idea of it. It'd be the most horrifying means of extinction. Didn't Futurama have this sort of happen with Bender cloning himself down so many times into microscopic size? That you might be aware of everything happening to you during surgery. The anesthesia keeps you from moving and causes you to forget. Yeah before my wisdom teeth removal the nurse told me that patients can still partially respond to the commands of the doctor while under anesthesia. And they just don't remember this afterward. When I went under I didn't even remember falling asleep. The one that bugs me was the one about the guy who was last seen in an airport. There's video of him just wigging the frick out and running away at full speed. They linked the surveillance footage and you can see him run all the way off the premises. He was never seen again. There's lots of theories about what happened. None I wanna look too far into. That we can sense when someone is watching us. So when we're alone and we get that feeling. Someone is probably watching you. It's scary that there are thousands of serial killers out there at any one given time who often just blend in with the rest of society and live normal lives. Many will never be caught. The comment, criminals are so stupid. No, criminals who get caught are stupid and we can't catch the smart ones. There is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is another theory which states that this has already happened, Douglas Adams. I'm not sure if that theory is connected to the one which talks about the apocalypse happening when someone calls God by his real name. That mind control actually exists. It's something that would never go public because whoever was able to perfect it first would be in the position to use it on whoever is aware of its existence. The great power of social media is they discovered they didn't have to control anyone's mind. They just put people in a bubble of misinformation until they make their own mind up. More of a story than a theory, but it correlates to some of these and makes me think some could be real. When I was younger I had this little stuffed animal dog I named Rocky. One night, my younger sisters and I, who all slept in the same room so we could hang out together, were messing around, and I two handed overhead tossed Rocky into the wall directly in front of my bed. He hit the wall, slid down behind whatever was in front of my bed, and was never seen again. I immediately went to go get him and he just wasn't anywhere. We tore the whole entire small room apart. We all saw the event occur. Over time the room has been completely emptied out, everything in it rearranged, walls painted, everything and no Rocky. He just completely phased out of existence. Makes me think he glitched out of the system or something. That the universe is infinite and there could be billions of other living organisms that all know about us and have significantly better technology and could wipe us out at any moment but choose to leave us be because they know that we don't know about them. Kinda like some indigenous tribes that live secluded and don't know that we are this civilized and technologically advanced. The theory that we're all quantum immortals and when someone dies in our reality for them they just keep on going in a reality where they didn't. This is very true. The theory basically says that all the parallel forms of ourselves are basically one infinite lifetime playing simultaneously and every time we survive a bad death experience, we actually continue in another lifetime. Spontaneous combustion. I watched a strange but true episode about this as a child and was convinced I'd randomly burst into flames one day. I'm over it now but that was my top fear for a long time. I've looked into it, nearly every case happened while the person was drinking and smoking at the same time, which kind of explains it. Some time in the future, if we don't disappear before, humans will probably be able to bioengineer themselves to avoid death by old age. Most probably only the richest people would get this, founding an immortal elite of dynasties that will be able to rule nations by themselves, while common people simply keep dying as always. Now almost everyone think of death as something normal and inevitable, as part of our nature. But then, in that hypothetical future, death will be seen like a disease which cure it's kept away from common people by that ruling elite. This is basically the premise of the show Altered Carbon. Give it a watch.
you might like it. This is pretty cliche but the theory that your whole known life you've been in a coma and have imagined everything. Your family isn't really your family and everyone and everything doesn't actually exist. Then when you wake up you'll have to live through life all over again with connections you've made to fake people. I like that this thread is filled with nightmarish death alien apocalypse universe ending scenarios but the top post is about someone's mother-in-law coming to live with them. Truly a minfuck. I had a professor in college who taught physics and he explained why we will likely never come across aliens. The universe is about 14 billion years old. Over the course of that time, it's likely that intelligent life, besides life on earth, has existed. However, 14 billion years is an insanely long time. Other life forms have probably risen and fallen thousands of times over. Extreme dynasties with technology we can only dream of having have probably existed. Life forms could have lasted hundreds of thousands of years and still not even be close to our timeline. The chances of other intelligent life forms existing at the same time as humans. In the 14 billion years the universe has hosted a possibility for life, is really unlikely. Statistically, intelligent life to have formed, prospered, or even existed at the same time as humans is extremely small simply due to the absolute drop in a bucket that we are on terms of time. We may very well be completely alone in the universe. May or not be a theory, but the first thing I thought of was that feeling you get when you're on top of a building and think what if I jumped or when you're driving and think what if I just swerve into traffic. Well it's actually got a name. El Apple du Vide. French for the call of the void. I always thought the idea of some ethereal presence calling you towards darkness. Creepy. Yeah, when I heard of this theory I did more research into it as I have experienced this before and apparently what causes it is by doing the thing you are in fear of happening you're eliminating the fear and the anxiety of the what if. I don't know if I worded it right but it's very interesting. Years ago when I was seriously dating my now wife, almost every time we started to have sexy time her mother would call up. Seems strange, then disgusting when we found the hidden camera when moving her out. Not a theory, but a condition. Sometimes a pregnant woman's brain can just break. She begins to believe her child isn't hers, or that it's a demon, or an alien. The worst part is these are perfectly healthy people who were otherwise happy and well adjusted beforehand. But when they get so far along in their pregnancy, the hormones can do something in their brain to change them completely. They become obsessed with the idea that their baby isn't theirs is some foreign object invading their body. The idea that for some people the happiest time in their life can be a time of pain and madness for others is terrifying. Especially since there's just no telling if or when it will happen. More of a philosophical idea rather than a theory, but solipsism. The idea that you are the only one that is real and that exists in this world. Everyone else and everything else is fake or is an illusion. What about anti-solipsism, where you are fake and everyone and everything else is real? That everyone you know who's dead is watching you now 24 stroke 7, even as you jerk off, and when you die they all come to greet you. They got other things to do like talk to their dead buddies. Our world is out perception of our surroundings in our three-dimensional life. It's possible that we are living amongst beings. Things and events that we cannot experience because we are three dimensions and they are not. Oh frick I remember this theory now. The Galleon bottleneck theory. Basically the reason we've never encountered or been contacted by aliens is because they're all dead. Every alien species that evolved to form advanced societies eventually outgrew their planet and destroyed themselves. Like we are. Some people have had some strange NDEs, near-death experiences. Going through websites cataloging them can be a trip. I'm willing to attribute some of them to brain damage and some as legit though I'll never be able to tell which is which. Deathbed visions give me a warmer sense of security. I can't imagine how peaceful it must be to die and see your deceased loved ones there to ensure you make it safely to the other side. Okay this is a weird one but me and my dad seen this one guy come out the gas station and he was bald and pale as crap with no hair at all. He was walking away from us as we were sitting in our truck eating. And I told my dad that he looked weird and resembled what people call the Mib. And that he might be a alien. I know it sounds dumb but this guy just didn't look real. He looked so odd. When right when I said that to my dad. 
The guy quickly looked at me like he had heard me. He was like 20 feet away and we had our windows up. Right when he looked at me I panicked and did the chin down nod that guys usually do and he nodded back and turned away. And then drove around us once and did the index finger wave almost like he knew what I had said. But that crap had me thinking for quite some time. I still bet to my dad that he was alien or something because with his weird demeanor and looks he fit the profile. The universe could be dying. And we'd have no way to know until we just suddenly vanish from existence. There could be a sort of quantum energy wave. Can't remember what it's called because it's been so long since I read about it. Zero point collapse. Maybe? Vacuum bubble burst? But whatever it is, it's an energy wave that starts at some point and spreads outward at the speed of light, annihilating any matter, energy, and even spacetime in its path. Because the wave travels at the speed of light, it is invisible. We would have no way of seeing it coming because any light emitted by it would hit us at the exact same time that the wave itself hits us. So, all of a sudden, the sun might just vanish from existence. We wouldn't notice because the sun's light from 8 minutes ago would still be reaching us. 8 minutes later, the earth just vanishes from existence. No warning. No trace. Reddit, what is your R Nolab story that actually happened? I lived in an apartment a few years ago. 4 units upstairs. 4 units downstairs. I lived upstairs, and the apartment below me was vacant. I kept hearing footsteps through the apartment, and I knew I shouldn't have. Nobody was downstairs. I asked someone to come over and listen, just to see if I was crazy. Maybe I'm just hearing other apartments since it's empty downstairs, and everything is echoing. Wrong, I kept hearing the footsteps. This went on for a solid hour. Finally I called the landlord and the police. Apparently someone had broken in through the windows downstairs, and was walking back and forth through the apartment with a knife. Freaking horrifying. This is why you always get the apt on the second, or higher, floor. While living with some friends, I got up late at night to get a drink of water from the kitchen. I didn't turn on any lights, having no trouble navigating in the dark. As I crossed through the living room, I heard some movement type noise or something and assumed it was my one of my roommate's pet cat. Go to the kitchen, drink water, leave kitchen. On my way back through the living room, I hear movement noises a lot louder than an old cat should make and I glance around. There on the couch, in the very dark living room is a shape, roughly child sized, with bright red eyes staring directly at me. I froze. The fear was so sudden and strong that it is in fact giving me goosebumps now. I very slowly stepped backwards, not daring to even blink as I watched the red orbs watch me. After several agonizingly long seconds, I reached the kitchen light switch, ready to defend myself when this goblin thing was sure to attack me. Click it was my other roommate's chinchilla. It had opened its cage and escaped from their room. It was sitting on top of a pile of laundry. My bedroom is on the second floor of the house. There's no patio porch overhang of any kind beneath my windows. Couple of years ago I was watching TV in bed around 2am and heard a louder than usual animal sound. Not uncommon to hear squirrels running around on the roof from time to time. Didn't think much of it. Kept on happening. And started to sound awfully close to the window and not on the roof. I ignored it for a pretty long time. After at least 40-45 minutes of being irritated by the noise. Best guess. I had watched a couple of episodes of South Park on my DVR during the time span. I banged on the wall in hopes of scaring them off until I could get to sleep. Get just two quick bangs with my fist. Which were answered with two bangs on the wall right next to the window from outside. Needless to say, I just about crap and jumped out of bed. Now, my living room has a bay window, and is on the other end of the house. So I could look out that window from the side and see my bedroom window. I hustle downstairs and peek out. I see a guy standing in front of my house, below my bedroom window. He's got a knife, small pocket knife, in his hand. And he's petting the front of my house. Call the police and wait. He never leaves the front of the house even when they roll up and ultimately disarm and arrest him without much struggle. Whoa, glad that ended well for you. I was about 19 living with a roommate going to college while living in an apartment complex. 
Occasionally I get mild bouts of insomnia but nothing serious, usually just a delay in my bedtime of an extra 2 or 3 hours. One night I suddenly just cannot sleep. Nothing will get me to relax and I eventually give up and just sit in the front room playing heavy rain all night as it had just come out a few days ago. The next day when I head off to work exhausted with zero hours of sleep I got a text from my roommate. Dude the police are all over the apartment complex. Apparently 9 apartments including our downstairs neighbor were broken into last night with people home sleeping. Some people even reported things being stolen from the rooms they were sleeping in. It hit me that had I not stayed up all night and left the light on in the front room I would have been robbed or worse. You couldn't sleep because there were enemies nearby. When I was in 5th grade some guy who was mentally ill had a meltdown somewhere in Chicago. Apparently he shot and killed some random guy and stole his car. He drove up I-94 towards my suburb, got off the highway, and drove straight into my neighborhood. It's very close to the exit and just started shooting sporadically at people's houses. He somehow wound up in my backyard, which is full of trees btw, and was just shooting in every direction. I can still vividly remember brake lights in the middle of the otherwise pitch black woods and sparks from the gunfire going off in every direction. The cops showed up and shot him to death. Luckily no one was hurt, but my neighbors did find a bullet in the middle of their mattress. Fireworks are not so fun anymore. The cops showed up and shot him to death. Luckily no one was hurt. Had a chuckle at that one. I was living in Fort Wayne, in for a short time and the house I stayed in was on the outskirts of the main city, set way back on a dirt road in Farmville. The house is over 200 years old and I would routinely freak myself out because of the age, location, and my only other roommates were two cats. Anyways, during one of the coldest nights in January, minus 15F, I heard someone frantically ringing my doorbell at 2.33am, slowly approaching the door to get a glimpse of my unexpected company before they realized I could see them. Suddenly I heard them thump across the wooden wrap around deck leading up to the front door and make their way to the big glass side door. I heard a moan groan. I heard someone jiggle the doorknob. By this time I am calling the cops and cowering in my room with my pistol drawn. During the 25 minutes it took for the cops to make their way up there to investigate, I could hear and see the shadows of people outside each window, trying each one to see if it slid open. When the cops arrived, they walked around the house and only identified one set of footprints in the snow, and one set of drag marks. Also they could identify where and when the person being dragged was seated down in the snow at various entry points while the other guy was checking for a way in. It moved shortly after, not because of the attempted entry but because Fort Wayne, in is a terrible place to live, TL, DR. Man with man and toe tried to cuddle, laid on the couch for the next 3 hours, clutching my .357 and watching my heart attempt to exit my chest cavity. I'm unfortunately from Fort Wayne and they were probably looking for stuff to steal to buy M. We moved into a new house a few months ago, as we were in the process of purchasing the house. The renter who was living in it died unexpectedly of natural causes in his mid 40s. He died right in the middle of the living room. Shortly after, we move into the house, and almost immediately our two year old daughter starts talking about the ghost that lives in our house. Now let's be real here, she is two and two year olds are very impressionable. Halloween had recently passed, and she had this Halloween themed picture book that she loved to read, so it's entirely possible that all this talk of ghosts was just coming from looking through that book on a regular basis. Still, she was always telling me that the ghost was in her playhouse in the basement, or that the ghost was on the stairs, or that the ghost was standing in the corner. She never seemed to be afraid of the ghost, and considered him to be her friend, so I wasn't all that concerned even if there really was a ghost haunting our house. If he's a nice and helpful ghost, it could certainly be a lot worse. I would often tell the ghost that he was welcome to stay if he wanted to, but he was also welcome to go if that would make him happier. I was about 30 stroke 70 on the ghost being real and she could see and talk to him versus the ghost being just her imagination fueled by her Halloween book. Until one day, when we were going out to the car to go to daycare in the morning. It was still dark out, and rainy. My daughter told me that the ghost was on the back deck. And then she told me that today was the ghost's birthday and she wanted to sing him happy birthday. Once again, I mostly disregarded what she was saying. 
as she is birthday obsessed and has in the past made us sing happy birthday to Mickey Mouse, a bowl of fruit snacks, and the bathroom. So we sang and wished the ghost a happy birthday and went on with our lives. Later that day, out of pure curiosity, I looked up the obituary of the man who had died in our house, and wouldn't you know it it was his freaking birthday. Upvote for singing happy birthday to a bowl of fruit snacks. Posted this before, but it's one of my family's favorite stories. My uncle called my mom one morning and told her this. I have four little cousins and who never got to meet my grandfather, he passed before they were born. One morning, they ran downstairs for breakfast as they usually do. As my uncle was getting their food ready, one pointed to the fridge and said that's him my uncle. Not thinking much of it, said who and looked over. They were pointing at a picture of my grandfather that they never got to meet. My cousin responded the man that comes and talks to us at night until we fall asleep sometimes. Not horrifying, but still, eerie. I work in a small building with three wings and my office is located in a little back hallway of one of the wings. I share the office with another girl and it's usually pretty quiet. One evening she and I were the only ones in our wing still there and we both heard a door loudly shut in the hallway. We were both a bit confused and, upon peeking out, I noticed nothing out of the ordinary. The next two weeks I was staying really late to catch up on hours so I could have a winter break. And I began noticing little noises in the hallway when I was positive nobody was in the building. It sounded like a shoe sliding on the floor. This happened a couple of times. Earlier in the evenings it would just be me and the janitor. And she started getting really spooked. She said she heard doors slamming in one of the wings even though everybody had left. We investigated one night to find that all of the doors were properly locked. But I noticed that the kitchen light was on. Even though the door was locked. The janitor freaked out because she knew she'd turned the light off before locking the door. I also recalled the light being on a couple of nights when I was the only one there. I started to ask around if other people in the building had experienced anything weird like that. And one lady said some of her room decorations would have moved when she came back from the bathroom. And here's the one that really creeps me out. Another lady said that one day she noticed a footprint in the middle of her desk. It's that black material that shows skin prints pretty easily. To be honest, I'd rather it be paranormal stuff, because the idea that there's a person doing all this really creeps me out. TL. DR. A mild white collar paranormal activity. I can only imagine that there was someone secretly living in the building. Yes, that's just as terrifying. This story is not mine, it's my grandfather's. Backstory, this takes place in West Virginia in the 20s. My grandpa is the youngest of 9 and his family is very poor. They all live in a one room house. My grandpa's sister suddenly got sick and quickly fell into a coma. They say she had a fever and would shake and even sit up in the middle of the night even though she was not conscious. She got progressively worse over the next few days and needed some sort of help. My grandpa and his oldest sister Glenna stayed behind while the rest of the family went to the neighbor's house 10 miles down the road for some food and medicine. As soon as the family got home that night their mom went to the sister's bed and started to put a cold cloth on her head. Immediately her eyes flew open for the first time in days and she looked her mother right in the eyes and said, The Lord wants Glenna. She fell back and twitched before going back into unconsciousness. The next morning Glenna and the sister had died. The younger sister died from the fever, and Glenna died from unknown causes. I'm late to the game and I shared this before years ago but why not? When I was a kid my parents would take me to the local zoo a lot during the summer. They had a small pack of about 4-5 or five wolves and they were my favorite. 5 year old me would sit for hours watching them run around and play or just nap. One female in particular seemed to like me. Every time I was there she came up and licked the glass as if I were her big weird puppy. I loved her the best. Well school started up again so I wasn't able to go to the zoo for several months. One night I woke up and had to go to the bathroom so I didn't bother turning on the light and stepped into the hallway and there was a wolf in our house. I yelped because it startled me, but I wasn't afraid. It just stood there looking at me until my mom came out of their bedroom to ask what was wrong. I didn't want them to think I was crazy because there's no possible way there really could have been a wolf in my house so I told her I saw a spider. I forgot about it until the next summer when we went to the zoo and the entire pack was gone. They'd all been wiped out by Pavo. 
I know there are a million logical explanations for what I saw, but I like to think it was my friend coming to say goodbye. Bruv, you've got a protective wolf ghost, that's a pretty powerful thing to have. So I had this whistle that was pretty crap, it was super obnoxious, with this terrible, but very distinctive, sound. It was like the death cry of a goose, followed by a rattling noise. It always hung off a bright orange lanyard, which I'd hook on the door handle of my front door. Every morning, I'd get up and see the awful whistle hanging from my door. Now, right next to my front door was a window that didn't quite latch it wasn't open all the time, but if you pushed on it for long enough, it would give way. One night, it was raining hard as heck. I woke up at 4am to the sound of banging downstairs. I assumed the wind had blown the window open, and I didn't want the carpet to get soaked, so I got up and went to close it up again. Sure enough, the window was wide open. As I went to close it, I heard something out the window. In the distance, I heard the freaking whistle. It was gone the lanyard and the whistle were off the handle, and someone was blowing the whistle somewhere out in the storm. I checked the house top to bottom nothing else was stolen, just the whistle. I fixed the window. Sounds like one of your neighbors hated your whistling. It was winter break, freshman year of college. I drove up to visit one of my friends in northwestern Pennsylvania for New Year's. I needed to be back home the next day for work, so I decided to drive back at like 2am. I was driving down into state 79. For anyone reading this from PA, it was around Grove City where this event took place and I maybe saw two cars in a 60 mile span. I came up around a bend and saw what looked like a black bear in my lane and I swerved and went off the road and crashed into the tree line next to the highway. I was in the middle of nowhere and the bear just booked it into woods. My car was freaking totaled and I knew I wasn't gonna see any cars for hours to help me out. I called 911 and they said they would come in like 20 minutes. I got out of the car and stood up on the shoulder of the highway and waited. After about 5 minutes I heard some rustling in the bushes and there it was. The freaking bear. Turns out when I went off the road I hit a cub and mama bear was pee as all heck. I booked it over to the back of the car and hopped in the trunk. Thank god I had a big Ford Expedition so the bear couldn't frick with it too much. For another half an hour the bear tried ramming the car and was trying to get at me in a frenzy. The police showed up and the siren scared mama bear off into the woods again. It was the most terrifying experience of my life. All of the alarms in my house went off at exactly midnight, then later in the night, all of the phones in my house rung at exactly 3am. I watched the Babadook the day before with my girlfriend Needless to say I was terrified. The boy in that movie was amazing. I don't think I've ever seen better child acting. When he's in the back seat and being attacked, it was insane. I've also never gone from hating a character so much to end up rooting for them in the end. My daughter slept in the bed with me for a few years after her father and I had divorced. Probably ages 3 through 6 or so. My bed was against the wall, and she slept on the side of the wall. I slept on my side facing her, so my bathroom was to my back. We had not fallen asleep yet, but had just been laying there being quiet and still. All of a sudden, she says, Mommy, why is there a man standing behind you? My body turned ice cold, and it felt like all of the blood drained out of my body. I finally got up the nerve to turn over and look. There was nobody there. She had said it so seriously, but the little toot was totally joking. I have never been so scared in my life, and to this day I will not sleep with my back facing that bathroom door. This was 13 years ago, and that is exactly why I do not want children. This is for my parents. I was about 3 years old, and it was way past my bedtime, but I was restless, and I snuck out of my bed and made my way to the living room, where my parents were watching a documentary about World War II. I remember hearing things like Hitler and Luftwaffe and Messerschmitt. Now, to a child toddler who had a trouble enunciating hard consonants, those words were actually very easy to replicate and sound out. Then I heard my parents talking to each other, idly wondering if the pilots all bought into that evil bad man Hitler's lies and how some of the pilots felt if they had a conscience at all. Anyways, the next day, I drew a crude plane on a piece of paper and was making airplane noises like I had overheard on TV. According to my mother, I never had expressed any interest in planes had no exposure to planes before, at least. 
not to her knowledge. So she was curious why I would suddenly draw a plane out of the blue. Comma it's my plane. Comma no. It's your plane? Yeah, my plane. It's Messerschmitt. Comma what? Comma Messerschmitt. Mama. I was in the Luftwaffe. Comma honey. Where did you hear those words? Comma I wanted to do good. But Hitler made me bad. Then I had to go away for a while. But now I'm here. Anyways. For years my parents were convinced that I was a reincarnated soul of a World War II German pilot. It wasn't until fairly recently that I had a random recall of the whole thing and told my parents. Everyone was very amused. That's hilarious. I probably would have crapped myself if I was your parent. Hunting with father-in-law. It's well before sunup. Maybe 5am. And we hiked to a patch of trees and sat down. Him maybe 70 yards south of me with me facing out into a clearing. He had a flashlight and I didn't have one on me at the time. It was so dark you couldn't see a hand in front of your face. After about 20 minutes, I hear something really big walking maybe 10 yards in front of me. From the sound of the leaves branches breaking, it sounded human sized. It startled me and I loudly called for my father-in-law to turn on the flashlight. Right in front of me, where the noise was coming from. I hear his voice say nah it's cool. The noise happened again about 10 minutes later and I called out to him. Assuming it was him making the noise. No response. So I made my way over to his camp and asked him if he had just walked near me. He said he hadn't gotten up the whole time. And was confused why I would have heard his voice. Skinwalkers. Man. That's the most chill skinwalker ever then. My paternal grandmother died when I was 6. I lived in NY. She lived in PA. I met her maybe twice. I was 6 years old, asleep in bed one night and for whatever reason I woke up and walked into my parents bedroom. My father had an easy chair in one corner for reading. I sat in the chair. On the opposite wall was my father's closet. It opened, and grandma came out and stood about 6 feet away. I just wanted to say goodbye, she said, smiled, waved and turned back and walked back into the closet, closing the door behind her. I went back to my room. About 2 hours later, about 6am, the phone rings. It was a call from PA that Grandma Catherine had died in her sleep. My mother came to wake me up to tell me, and I said, I know. What do you mean? She came to say goodbye last night. She made me repeat the story three times, and then told me never, ever to tell my father that story, and I never did. Similar story, was in my early 20s and awoke at 4am to this wait at the end of my bed. My grandfather was sitting there, said my name, and then disappeared. Two hours later I get a call that he unexpectedly passed away at 4am. Home from grad school during Christmas break. Sleep still fricked up from finals aka caffeine, and worse, over usages. So at 4am, I'm downstairs at my parents house, reading. The original Dracula, Bram Stoker's, when Dracula wants to go to England, he hops on boat. During the voyage he kills all crewmen, the last of which he lashes to the helm of the boat, the steering wheel gizmo, still steering, though dead. As the boat crashes into the coast of England dead people don't dock for crap. Dracula changes himself into a dog, he jumps from the boat and as he lands, a huge bolt of lightning strikes, much thunder ensues. At that exact moment. A huge bit of thunder and lightning outside my folks house. December thunderstorms pretty rare in midwest. So I levitate from the couch like the lightning had hit me directly in the butt. So freaked out. And probably still a little whacked from finals. That I got a butcher knife from the kitchen and wandered all through the downstairs area. Finally going upstairs to my bedroom. With knife. No idea what I thought I was looking for. If I'd seen a dog. I probably would have stroked out then and there. This reminds me of the time I had just finished reading Pet Cemetery. Woke up for school early that December morning, still dark, and saw on the front porch in the fresh snow the prints of a small child and a cat. Although I knew it was probably from a barn cat and the neighbor boy that catches the bus at our house, it's still frightening the things that books can do to your mind. Years ago, around Halloween, my family had gathered to watch scary movies. My mom loved these shows. My dad didn't care much for them, so he would get up every few minutes to work on something or other. We had started watching Hitchcock's The Birds, and it was getting late. 
probably close to midnight, and it was getting cold. Not just the late October chill of the foothills we lived it, the house was getting cold. At first my mom just asked my dad to turn up the thermostat, but after couple minutes of the furnace running and the house not warming up, he realized he'd need to go check the furnace. He grabbed a lighter and headed downstairs. A minute later, we hear him shout for us. You have to come see this he says with something that sounds part excitement, part nervousness in his voice. We get down there to see him shining a flashlight into the furnace. Peering in, first we just noticed the pilot light was indeed out, then we saw the reason. A dead bird, something about the size of the palm of my hand, maybe a sparrow, had flown into the furnace from outside and put the flame out. I posted my story over in our humanoid encounters. In 1993, our family lived in a small town called Ritzville, Washington. I was 5 years old at the time and what I experienced has left me thinking about it every single night for the past 22 years. I shared a room and bunk bed with my little brother. The room had a small, fairly deep closet located a few feet from the foot of the bunk bed. Located on the wall was small vent that at night, when the living room light was on, would shine through giving my room a slight ambient glow. Well, one night I had to go to the bathroom, and when I sat up and was about to take the covers off, I noticed that at the foot of the bunk bed was this, tall black figure with a giant oval head that spanned the width of the bunk bed staring at me. It had two small yellow eyes that were far apart and I noticed this thing stood around 6 feet tall. Its skin was charcoal and lumpy. I stared at it for a good 5 seconds before I threw the covers over my head. 5 seconds of this monster being ingrained into my head. I could feel the evil surrounding it. I was up for a while before I fell asleep again, so I have no idea how long it was there. In the morning the first thing I noticed was the closet door. I make it a habit to close closet doors every night but it was wide open. My mom was the first to know about it and you know how most parents kind of wave off their kids experiences as a bad dream? She didn't. She knew I saw something because they've seen things. I had nightmares for weeks after seeing it. In my dreams this being picked me up and started torturing me. I haven't seen it since and I never want to see it again. Comma Ritzville, Washington. This sounds like a town name I would make up when I was angry. She knows I can't afford to go out this week. This ain't Ritzville, Washington. About 4 years ago I was getting off work late around 11pm when I hopped on the highway to head home. I got onto the I-10 in the middle of Phoenix, Arizona. This a big city on the busiest highway they have. But when I got on there was no one for a mile or two until I came across a police cruiser driving about 5 miles an hour zigzagging back and forth the entire width of the highway with lights on. This was the first time in my 15 years of driving I've ever encountered something like this and did not know what to do so I slowed down to his speed and just stayed behind him. We were the only two on the road and this crap went on for about 20 minutes. I started creaking out because there was just no one else on the road. Like, was I not supposed to be here? WTF is going on? And then just like that the cop turned his lights off and took off, and fast. So I did too. For about a quarter mile until I started coming across the most insane car catastrophe I have ever seen. There were at least a hundred wrecked cars on the side of the road and in the road. Some looked like minor damage while some were completely fricked. I remember seats from a minivan just lying in the middle of the road. But the weirdest part was there were no people. Not a single freaking one. No drivers, passengers, no cops, paramedics, fire trucks, nothing. It's like this huge crazy crash happened and they came and loaded everyone up and just left. It was like driving through a scene of The Walking Dead. Completely unreal. Four years later and I have not met a single person who saw it or found a news article on it. People think I'm crazy. Maybe those were the ghostly remains of all the crashes that had ever occurred in that stretch of highway. And the cop was a sort of guardian angel who got you to slow down so you wouldn't be added to the bunch. I work night shift as a palliative care RN in a very big, very old nursing home. It's important to note that this home and the religious organization that ran it are currently part of the royal inquiry into the institutional response to the abuse of children. The nurses that had worked there for 30 plus years used to delight in telling younger staff that when it was used as a children's home they used to bury children that died in the rose garden. This old rose garden was apparently under a newer wing of the home. 
At least four times in my two years of working there we would have elderly, close to death patients wake, totally lucid in the dead of night and ask us please tell the little girl to get out of my room or please get that little boy out of the corner. He's looking at me, being in this huge, dark, old, creepy building that had a very awful history and then that happening frick that. I would never do my rounds alone when it happened. It was terrifying. It made my blood run cold and I'd get a friend to work with me the rest of the night. I was not the only person this happened to, either. It was a regular occurrence. Kind of a non-lab for a short while. One Halloween a couple of groups from the neighborhood got into an egg fight. None of us hated each other just in different cliques. As the opposing forces started to march forward we took off running to retreat to a safer distance. As I we entered the woods I quickly bolted behind a tree and everyone from the opposing side passed me by. Or at least I thought. Apparently Bill got caught by a branch and was trying to free himself. I got from behind the tree to give him a hand since he was having a hard time. Right as I got to him he looked up and our eyes locked. He had a true look of horror in his eyes. I asked him if he needed some help and he muttered very lowly. Yeah, sure so we got him loose and I ran off to rejoin the fight. Next day in school someone walked up and said is what Bill said true being as smart as yup and walked off. Then it happened a second time, then a third and fourth. I responded yup each time. I'd be lying if I didn't say that I was curious as to what they were talking about but I just played along since everyone asked it the same way. As if they are finding out that ghosts really do exist. So at lunch I see Bill walk up and say hey Bill, I have a question. He mutters lowly yeah, what I respond why is everyone asking me if what you said is true. He said, okay it was the weirdest thing, you, weren't, there. Next thing I know you are standing in front of me. You just appeared out of thin air. I know there must be an explanation but dude, you were not there. I know you weren't. I laughed and told him I was behind the tree and saw that he was stuck just just stepped out to help. He puts his hand on my shoulder and breathes a sigh of relief. He said Jesus Christ. I was scared to death. I've been telling the story to see if anyone else had this happen with you. For a while I could disappear and appear randomly. It is a nice story. But Bill sounds like he might be a little dumb. What's the scariest space fact mystery in your opinion? A few people have said this but just the size of space is creepy to me. That far away. But what almost oppresses me more that unlike in Stargate I will never be able to travel to any of it. Would love to see what's out there. But, endless space could equal endless possibilities. Could be bad but it could be amazingly good. Not scary exactly. More unfortunate if anything, but we'll probably never be able to properly communicate with alien species. Given the amount of distance between the planets of our solar system, I'd assume the distance to other universes and galaxies is too far to think about right now. If we receive and send a message right now, by the time we hear a reply back, we would probably be a completely different government and societal system. We would just be constantly introducing ourselves. Yeah they'd really have to do all the legwork on that one. Literally physically get to us for any communication. Here's one closer to home. The Kessler effect is the theory that a single destructive event in low earth orbit could create a cascade where satellites break up into tiny fragments taking out other satellites, breaking up into smaller fragments and so on. Until the earth is completely surrounded by a massive cloud of tiny flying death shrapnel which would make leaving this planet almost impossible. If you look up how much space debris there is already up there and how many satellites currently orbit, plus the continued growth of the commercial space industry, I think about it a lot. You should read 7Fs, it could get worse. Ever gone on a road trip and hit a patch where you're just driving for hours and you don't see anything exciting? I've experienced this in Australia, Canada and USA, all very large countries. Imagine doing that for years traveling to another planet. Only to find out that due to a small rounding error, your ship is a hundredth of a degree off, and your century is off course. Gamma ray bursts. We could be hit by one of these with very little warning, and if it was reasonably close in universal terms anyway, could wipe us out rapidly or cause a ton of damage. Dark matter dark energy, 
The fact that about 95% of the universe is made up of matter we can't see or detect is pretty unsettling to think about. Also, while not a fact per se, I like to think that perhaps the answer to the Femi paradox is that there are billions of advanced alien life forms out there, but they are physically unable to reach us due to technological limitations. Perhaps interstellar transport is only theoretical, and any aliens capable of reaching us are unable to do so in an acceptable length of time. A Proxima Centauri may take 25 years for unmanned spacecraft to reach us going 20% the speed of light, but perhaps it's impossible to transport actual life at these speeds without dying. So advanced civilizations have realized the futility of trying to contact other species and have simply given up. Been searching for a comment saying gamma ray bursts. I remember when I was taught about them I was gonna crap myself mayo. Rogue planets. Planets that do not follow any given orbit. They may have been in an orbit at one time, but now they refuse to play by the rules. They were most likely knocked out of their orbit by another body, and now they are set on doing the same. There's a strangely artistic movie called Melancholia that has such a planet. That part of it is disturbing. I can't accept the fact that there is no end in space, but if there is indeed an end, then, what's beyond it? I'm stuck to an absurdity. The Boots Void, an area of space where there should be 50,000 or so galaxies, compared to other areas of the same size, but there's only about 60, could just be empty space for some unknown reason, or it could be an ever-expanding into galactic empire using Dyson spheres. Also I think it appears to be growing but that could just be galaxies moving away from the void. I think everything is terrifying about space, and I freaking love it, but one thing it'd scare me a lot, it's if space and infinite, imagine what kind of gigantic monster can be in there. My favorite debate I've ever had with a friend is about gigantic space monsters. I argued that since space is infinite and we don't understand much about it that there's a good chance that there's a gigantic space monster that's just a massive head that eats planets to live. We went back and forth for like 15 minutes. Since the universe is expanding and stars and galaxies are moving away from each other, it's possible that civilizations that spring up in the far future with lonely stars will see an empty sky. Their civilizations will grow and learn, but they will never know the universe that once was. We live in a spectacular time period where we can actually look back in time and see the early universe. Future civilizations won't have that luxury. They'll believe that the universe is, and always was, dark, dead, and empty, aside from their small island of light. With that in mind, you have to wonder what stellar phenomena may have populated the universe billions of years ago but are now too far away for us to ever detect. There is literally no end to the universe. No matter how long we study it there will always be stuff that we will never know just because of the vastness of space. There could also be multiple universes, which is unbelievable considering that we know so little about our own. What was before the Big Bang? I think it is just impossible for a human to comprehend pure nothing or infinity. I myself had a stroke at age 9 due to a ruptured vertebral artery and lost a third of my visual field. I can confirm that it is not black. A good analogy is it is like what you see behind your head. On the other hand, infinity is so large that if you spent your whole life writing a 1 then zeros on paper, that insane number would still be 0% of infinity. I just think there is no way to fully understand the universe and there never will be. This is why even ancient societies explained things with gods because they didn't understand how the reality we live in started and I don't think we ever will. Since time began at the big bang, the term before is meaningless, but before that. The great attractor is kinda ominous. There's an exoplanet with wind that's many times the speed of sound in that rains glass. Another exoplanet that has spent time inside its star. There's a sort of fear that we aren't alone in the universe. Chances are anything we meet won't have remotely similar emotional spectrums that we have. Then there's the horrifying notion that we are alone in that infinite blackness. That we're just a fluke of chemistry that will probably never happen again. The fact that an asteroid could come at any time. And even though we have the technology to tell us that an asteroid is about to impact Earth, what can we really do about it? Nothing. We can do nothing. We can just sit here, with the media stations telling us what will happen, telling our friends and loved ones goodbye, praying, etc. 
It sucks. Why do we have the technology that tells us our inevitable doom is days, or even moments, away but no technology to possibly stop it? I mean, I feel like we'd figure something out real quick if we had at least a week. Yeah it could end up just being throw a bunch of rockets at it until all the impacts change its course, but that's still worth a try. There could be life, but not in the way we think. Like a virus that our immune system simply can't take and we can't cure or make a vaccine for. This was actually thought of before, when the crew from Apollo 11 came back from the moon, they were quarantined for 3 weeks just in case they did have some kind of space virus. Thankfully there were none of these during the Apollo 11 mission. The quarantine was so terrible, the astronauts found ants and insects inside the room that have entered through the many holes it had. The coldest place in the universe is not the Boomerang Nebula, or even in space. No, it's the inside of a D-Wave quantum computer, at 15 MK. Coldness in space is so funky cause there's a limit. Like we know how cold the coldest thing can be. There's nothing in all of existence colder than absolute zero. Nothing. Space is big. More than people can easily grasp. I absolutely believe other intelligent life exists. I absolutely believe Earth-like planets with orbits in their star's habitable zone and liquid water exist. And I absolutely believe that with enough time humanity will confirm the existence of both. I also believe manned spacecraft will never leave our solar system. The time and energy required just to reach orbit is massive. The resources necessary to keep a person alive in space are huge. Landing people on Mars is already viewed as a one-way trip, and at its nearest pass it's roughly 34 million miles from Earth. Voyager 1 has been traveling for 42 years and 9 months, it is just shy of 150 or astronomical units, or mean distance of the Earth from the Sun, from home, or nearly 14 billion miles, it is just past the heliosphere of our Sun, or the point at which the Sun's solar wind no longer exerts enough influence to cast a bubble in the background into stellar radiation, but this is considered interstellar space, as a frame of reference. The next star over Proxima Centauri is 268,770 or from our sun, or 25 trillion miles, unless some kind of einstein rosen bridge type of wormhole exists that we can travel, we're not going anywhere. We will certainly travel to other stars one day. Imagine what humanity would look like if we kept our crap together and progressed for another 100,000 years. The industrial and scientific revolution is only a few hundred years behind us at this point. We've got a Luwuung way to go. Right now we're still figuring out how to survive on our own planet. A fact from a show I used to like. The main problem is pressure. There isn't any. So, don't hold your breath or your lungs will explode. Blood vessels rupture. Exposed areas swell. Fun fact. The boiling temperature of water is much lower in a vacuum. Which means that your sweat and your saliva will boil, as will the fluid around your eyes. You won't notice any of this because 15 seconds in, you've passed out as oxygen bubbles formed in your blood. And 90 seconds in, you're dead. There is no guarantee that the universe won't end in the next 10 seconds. Update. It didn't. Humans exist within a time frame of Earth's life where the moon is just at the right distance that we have solar and lunar eclipses the way we do now. The coincidence is just a little too uncanny for my tastes, but it also shows how things can just majestically turn out the way they do out of pure chance. I actually find that comforting, not scary. The fact that when you look at the sun you see it as it was 8 minutes ago, meaning if it were to explode we will not see it explode until 8 minutes because that is the amount of time it takes for the light of the sun to reach earth. Also, it's really really loud but the sound can't travel without an atmosphere. Strange matter, it might not exist at all, but some scientists believe it's what's inside neutron stars. If this is true, neutron stars can collide and send strange matter particles flying through space. It's also theorized that strange matter might turn everything it touches into strange matter. If that's true, any microscopic amount of strange matter that touches our atmosphere would quickly turn Earth and everything on it into strange matter, destroying all life and nearly every remnant of civilization, and there wouldn't be a dang thing we could do about it. Again, this is all theoretical. Strange matter might not have such a massive effect, 
and indeed it might not exist at all, but there is a non-zero chance that an undetectable, microscopic particle is flying toward earth ready to eradicate everyone and everything. There's a region of space where the ever-present cosmic radiation from the Big Bang is missing. The radiation is everywhere is space except this area there's none. The Boltzmann Brain. The most likely ending to our universe will be all stars and black holes exploding and eventually the universe becomes a completely even soup of neutrons for all eternity. In this theory, the Big Bang was actually a cosmic coincidence, in which enough of those neutrons, literally every neutron that currently exists, collided in the even soup of a past universe. This collision caused the Big Bang to occur, thrusting into motion the energies that run our current universe. Such an occurrence in the soup of infinite neutrons is incredibly unlikely. What instead is far more likely is that just enough neutrons came together in the exact right way as to create a literal floating brain in the infinite soup that has all of your memories and experiences up to the current moment. Statistically speaking, it is unfathomably more likely that nothing you've ever perceived exists and, instead you are merely a floating brain in an endless expanse of nothing, doomed to return to the soup from whence you came, none the wiser. Welp, not sleeping ever again. Nothing is forever not me not the earth not the sun not our galaxy and not the universe one time there will be nothing and no one that taught makes me feel useless and scared but it calms me down when I'm stressed. Space is composed entirely of cheese whiz but they won't admit it. They paint the sky black at night to keep us all fooled. There was a star 20,000 light years away that put out a burst of energy in 2 stroke 5 of a second that was more energy than our own sun produces in 100,000 years. It was enough to disrupt satellite and GPS signals. If that star was only half the distance away at 10,000 light years. It would have stripped the earth of its atmosphere and irradiated the earth enough to destroy all life. You know those classic utopian sci-fi stories, where benevolent aliens come down and end all the wars and uplift them to super intellects and give everyone miraculous technology and immortality and welcome them into a peaceful galactic union and everything? Ever wonder why, if aliens are roaming around faster than light, they haven't swung by us yet? One of the answers to that question. We might be the first, depending on how long it takes life to develop. We might be the first to evolve to a point where we could plausibly make that happen without nuking ourselves into oblivion or destroying our atmosphere or what have you. It might be up to us, whether we make it or not as an interstellar species. We have the responsibility of getting our crap together, because it may well be up to us to save everyone else. Uncountable genocides, wars, famines. Death on a scale larger than our species have ever understood. Literally the fate of the universe might depend on us. I look around at us now, and that's what scares me. Someday, all the hydrogen will burn out, trillions of years in the future, and there will be no activity or energy and everything will be so far apart that it will just be a cold dark wasteland with no life or light. It's quite possible, likely even, that we'll never leave this solar system. Because even getting up to a modest fraction of the speed of light, travel elsewhere just takes too dang long. Pretty much all science fiction hand wavs this with jump drives and so on. But any kind of device like that would violate causality and is fairly unlikely to be possible. If you were to instantly take off your spacesuit while floating in space, the side of your body facing the sun would cook while the other would freeze. Everything in just under a couple of seconds. At least your middle would feel quite lovely. Gamma Ray Bursters. One burst can wipe out all life in a 3000 light year radius. And we don't know if there's a candidate star or not within that distance. 1. We are the only intelligent beings in the entire universe. 2. We aren't the only intelligent beings in the entire universe. Both are equally terrifying, yet one of them is true. And we don't even know which one that is. False vacuum, summed up, the universe can at any point cease to exist, we wouldn't witness even a trillionth of a second of the event, it would just happen. The Bobbitt's Void and the Femi Paradox, the Bobbitt's Void is a massive area of space with very few galaxies in it, and millions of light years across, if I remember right, we only know of 60 galaxies in the void, where did it come from, why are there so few galaxies, we don't know, don't quote me. 
I'm not an expert. I'm just going off of what I know in my memory. Edit. I also remember hearing it's so big that it defies the laws of physics. But like I said, don't quote me and feel free to correct me. The Femi Paradox is a paradox that basically says there are hundreds of thousands of stars capable of supporting life in our galaxy. If that's the case, then where is all of it? Why haven't we heard from anyone? The Femi Paradox says life experience is a barrier. Either we have passed it and are one of the few that have passed the barrier. For example, becoming sentient. Or we haven't passed it, and we're coming up on it. Stuff like the development of nuclear weapons that could kill us all. Or developing the technology to leave our home system. We could be in a galactic graveyard and not know it. Are we alone? Are we some of the first to pass the barrier? We don't know. Or if we do know, no one's telling the freaking public. I like to believe we aren't alone. Aliens 65 million light years away could theoretically see the dinosaurs on per Earth with a microscope advanced enough. T telescope. The notion that if there is other intelligent life in the universe, it might be in their best interest to annihilate any life they find, and ours, even if we haven't realized it yet. Pale blue dot, an image of Earth taken by the Voyager 1 space probe from a distance of 6 billion kilometers. Seeing the whole world on Earth as an important in comparison to the ghastly vastness of the universe is scary. On the other hand, it is the most exciting thing about it. Gives a whole new perspective on life. We don't know much about what's happening. Why should we? Check out Carl Sagan's pale blue dot speech. Perhaps this isn't very fitting, as I don't think it's necessarily scary. But it now the multiverse theory? For those who don't. It essentially says that there's a whole bunch of universes, some similar, some different. If there's something that should exist on Earth but doesn't, then it exists in an alternate universe. Spider-Man is real, in an old universe, etc. But if the universe is infinite, then wouldn't everything possible happen within this infinite time space? Is the universe itself the multiverse? What if there's another Earth way 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 far out there that's entirely made of Legos? with lego people, and if the universe is the multiverse, then is science as we know it unreliable outside of our immediate area? Do physics work completely differently further out? Work by different formulas? What if there's living creatures out there that don't have a single cell in their bodies? Things that exist without a single atom? I mean, aren't black holes themselves kinda that already? Who says reality as we know it applies to the entire universe? What if Thanos is actually real somewhere way out there? What if dreams are just somehow seeing alternate worlds? What if that King Kong sized Buzz Lightyear that kidnapped me in a nightmare I had when I was really young actually exists? Again, maybe not super scary, but I felt it was at least somewhat relevant. A few years ago, a neutron star experienced a star quake, and for a brief moment, a crack formed in the star's ultra-dense outer shell, releasing a terrifying amount of energy. Even though the neutron star was thousands of light years away, the burst of mostly gamma rays traveled across the galaxy to damage the very satellites we sent up to detect neutron stars, which wasn't something scientists thought could happen. If something similar happened to a neutron star within 1200 light years of Earth, it could fry off the atmosphere of the planet. Luckily the closest neutron star of that magnitude is over 60,000 light years away. I'm not sure I have it exactly right, but here goes. The observable universe has been expanding away from us at the speed of light. So even if we invented a light speed craft we couldn't escape the space we have already seen. There are four main forces that govern pretty much everything in the universe. The string nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, and gravity. Of these, gravity is by far, like, several orders of magnitude, the weakest of the four. On a scale of 110, gravity would be around 0.001. I'm fuzzy on the actual math, but it's basically a kitten versus three adult tigers. Now, go outside at night, and look into the sky. You're not looking up, not really. You're looking into infinity through a super thin skin around a rock. All of those stars you see are gigantic furnaces of electromagnetic and nuclear power. And the only thing keeping you from falling off this spinning ball of dirt and into that infinity forever is... For gravity. The concept of time just fricks with me too much. 
We perceive that everything has a beginning but there was no beginning for time. It just is. One day we decided to start counting but there was no beginning because how can there be the beginning of time? If you say there is a beginning, what was there before? There has to be something. Just graduated with my astronomy degree this past May. One of my largest existential crises came from my teacher doing the math to show how slow we are compared to how giant the universe is. My bad if this is wrong. But the Falcon 9 goes 24,000 mph and the closest galaxy is Andromeda at 1.49 times 10 to the power of 19 miles away. At this rate, going at full speed on our most advanced rocket, it would take 6.2 times 10 to the power of 14 hours. Like 68 billion years or mayo. Cool thing though is once we can find an efficient enough energy source and are able to go 70% the speed of light, the speed where time dilation and length contraction start to occur in special relativity, we'd easily able to travel to other galaxies and crap. But as of right now at 24,000 miles per hour, that's only 0.003% the speed of light. Mayo. Nowhere close to the 70% we would need to use special relativity to do any actual galactic traveling. TLDR space is freaking big and it would take over 68 billion years to get to our closest galaxy neighbor if we were flying full speed on a Falcon 9. What are some true scary experiences that you redditors have been through? Creepy strangers. Unexplainable incidents. Narrow misses. ETC. I once found myself in a cave along with 8 or 9 other people. It was the middle of the Pennsylvania wilderness, and the only entrance was a small hole in the ground. To enter, you had to sit on your butt, grab a tree root, and drop about 7 feet down a steep wall to the floor. We all dropped in, and spent at least half an hour exploring this cave. My friend Dan taps me on the shoulder and whispers, Dude, look at the ceiling. The ceiling was just high enough above our heads to hide the thousands of spiders crawling around on it. We tried to keep quiet about it, because we didn't want anyone to flip out, but there was no stopping it. Just seconds later the whole group noticed them. Everyone got silent, and you could actually hear the spiders crawling on the surface of the stone. It was an extra nerve wracking situation, because the only way to exit the cave, was to basically jump up and pull yourself out of a hole surrounded by spiders. Two of the girls with us were terrified, and refused to climb out. They just couldn't muster the courage to put their faces next to a giant spider nests. They came around though, and everyone got out safe. I had the honor of being the last one to exit, alone in a dark cave filled with spiders, and nobody around to give me a boost. Fortunately, Dan was brave enough to reach down in and give me a hand. When we first discovered that cave, we were all alike. I can't believe we've never heard of this place, now I know why. That cave sucks. A few months later, I found out the cave is off limits in the fall, because of the rattlesnakes. Frick that cave. When I was about 12, I had a lot of issues with night terrors, and rarely slept a whole night through. One night, I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I sat down, half asleep and thinking of nothing but emptying my bladder and going back to bed when I see movement out of the corner of my eye. There was a man standing by the other door to the bathroom staring at me, not moving. He was wearing a tattered grey jumpsuit and had a crutch, little to no hair. I don't remember how I got down into the basement where my parents slept but suddenly there I was, hysterical. My dad finally went up and looked in the bathroom and kitchen. Saw nothing but allowed me to sleep on the couch down there anyway. I didn't fall back asleep. About an hour or so later, I heard the sliding door to the bathroom from my sister's room and limping footsteps. The next morning my dad searched around and noticed that the fridge and pantry had been raided. Never caught the guy. Reposted from previous scary thread a while back. I was driving home through back roads I had never been on and came across a bookstore in a tiny town in the woods. The bookstore was actually a house, where the front of the home had been converted into a store. There was a box on the porch that said .50 books so I stopped to see if there were any Stephen King books in there. Middle aged woman comes out with a huge smile, and gives me a bowl of fruit and some tea. I'm like, this place is awesome and rifle through books while eating the fruit and downing the tea. Inside the store home, there were a lot of cool art books and stuff, so I spent some more time in there. She brought me more tea, even when I said, no thank you, that's plenty, she kept refilling, 
Gave me dessert too. Brownies and cookies. I didn't realize it at the time, but she was drugging me. It's hazy to remember the details. But at some point, she closed the shop, telling me to take my time looking at the books. She told me that she was going to go take a shower, and was gone for a while. When I was ready to pay, I had to wander back through her house to find her. I found her in her bedroom. She was in bed. I'm pretty sure she was naked. At the time, I thought weird. She's watching an exercise video in bed but later realized she was watching P. You might think this is hot, but it isn't. She was my mom's age, and had been telling me how she reminded me of her kids in college. So, not hot. I told her I was ready to pay, and she told me how to open the register. So I went and opened it, put in what I thought I owed, took out the change, and left. When I stumbled outside, a fire engine drove by, screaming with sirens. In the distance was the glow of a big forest fire, and the stars were being covered by smoke. A tall man on a horse watched the fire truck pass. He looked right at me, took a piece of wood or something out of his mouth, and said, Town's burning. I swear to god I have a crystal clear memory of this happening, even though I'm sure it couldn't have. By this point, I guess I was seriously tripping balls on something. I'm not a drug guy, so I don't know what I had, but I was out of my mind and could hardly walk. I got back in my car, and drove, home along twisting roads on tall cliffs above the ocean. Twice I realized I was on the wrong side of the road. One of the times I realized this because a massive truck was headed straight for me, laying on the horn and flashing its lights. I kept thinking about how my car could be like an airplane and a submarine if I drove it off the cliff. I can't believe I made it home alive. Later I realized I was in that house for about 4 hours looking at books. At least that's what I hoped the heck I was doing. TL. DR. A middle aged woman drugged me, and I probably almost ended up as a gimp in her basement. I am an electrician so I tend to get into undesirable places. For instance, I was under a house with a cordless sawzall to make a hole for a cooktop vent. I started to hear some scurrying noises and shined my flashlight towards the noise to find three cottonmouth snakes coming my way. Apparently primal fear makes me wield that saw like a freaking ninja. Me three snake zero. Not me but a friend of mine. Female, about 22 at the time, worked for Google Maps as some sort of surveyor or photographer. Google sends her and another female co-worker to some remote location in Mexico for a few days for business. The hotel they were staying at was apparently nice enough, but literally outside the walls of the hotel was a really rough ghetto with people living in boxes lining the streets. Anyway, the first day of the trip she and her co-worker are taking a taxi to the location they have to survey and at a red light. Some crazy guy opens the door, tries to pull my friend out and then starts stabbing her in the chest with a knife. The cab driver pulled away but not before she'd been stabbed six times. She survived but has pretty bad scars and has become a much different and quieter person since. When I was about six years old I went to the CD carnival that was set up in a mall parking lot with my dad and my grandma. We were waiting on line for the infamous Piray chip ride. My dad got off the line to get us drinks. Maybe about 5 minutes later a man grabs my hand and says come on. This line's too long and starts leading me away. I remember my grandma yelling after me Mel that's not your father. I looked up and saw this man wearing matching a matching pair of faded denim jacket and jeans. Cheap Nazca sunglasses. And a firefighter's mustache. When he saw that my grandma was screaming he let go of my hand and vanished into the crowd. We told these cops that were standing by their cars and they said they couldn't do anything. It actually bothered me for a very long time. I was in India for work, staying at a fairly nice hotel. I don't do this often. I usually like to head straight to the room and order room service while watching a movie. But I decided to have a drink at the lobby bar. I had a drink on my own. There was no one else around in the bar and I made small talk with the bartender. I ordered another drink and decided to use the bathroom. I was gone a couple of minutes and when I got back I noticed that my drink, scotch and dry, had a cloudy white rim at the top which isn't normally there. On closer inspection, the cloudy froth was settling into a powdery residue on the side of the glass. 
I asked the bartender what was wrong with the drink and he at first acted like he didn't notice anything. I was suspicious now and kept at it until he acknowledged he saw something. I mean, it was obvious, there was this froth 2-3 millimeters around the glass. Then he said that it always happens and it's nothing. I then looked him directly in his eyes and asked, did he put anything in my drink? It's hard to explain, but his response, though it was no, told me everything I needed to know. So I made out like I was more curious than anything, and asked him whether he would taste it. He said no and said he would pour me another. I declined and said I would drink it, but I just wanted him to tell me if it was off or not. All this while, there was this awkward vibe where we both knew the jig was up but we were pretending like this wasn't happening. I paid up and left the drink where it was, locked and latched my door, the whole time picturing myself lying in a bath of ice, sun organs. I always feel crappy when I make statements that could be construed as generalizations, but as a single American woman who's traveled alone in all sorts of countries, I can say hands down India is full of the sketchiest, gropiest, sexual assaultiest guys I've ever seen. It was a dark and stormy night. I was spending the summer in FL, with an aunt and uncle. I left with my uncle to go get dinner and bring it home, and when we got back, house was strangely quiet. Their three yo son quiet in his crib, searched the house, could not find my aunt. Then we saw the 200 pound glass sliding patio door storm panel was missing. It had been flung out onto the patio and my aunt was under it. We freaked. It took both of us to lift it off her. She was convulsing, froth running down her face. I called 911. Uncle held her head. We figured it out over the next few hours days. Aunt had been closing the patio door reached up to turn off the light switch, and the house and she both were struck by lightning, went in her hand and out her nose, later we found all her nose hairs were burned, she had somehow been flung outside with the sliding door, she survived, had electrical tremors and symptoms for about 2 years, tl, dr, mother nature can be a total b, I used to work graveyards at a circle k in a northern ca college town, CA law states that no alcohol can be sold between 2 6 a.m. At about 2 45 a.m., a couple of guys come into the store, go to the cooler to grab a couple of 18 packs of crap beer, cause, keystone, can't remember now, I tell the leader of the duo that it's after 2, I can't sell the beer to him, as he starts getting irate, I offer him a free coffee, soda, candy bar, but I can't sell the beer. Cops and management had been all over our asses for questionable sales. The leader gets the 1000 yard stare in his eyes and proceeds to start reaching for the small of his back. At which point his buddy says, stop, man, it's not worth it. The leader smiled at me and winked and said see you soon, and left. Two days later I got fired for telling the regional dickhead that two people needed to be on at night, and a few other things, so my assistant manager had to cover my shift. That night he was robbed and had the crap knocked out of him by a guy that fit the description of the tool I'd dealt with a few nights before. TL. DR. Narrowly avoided getting a shotgun shoved in my face, but a friend wound up with it instead. Strange things are always afoot at Circle K. I was waiting at a red light at a four-way intersection. It turned green. I looked over at a gas station and saw my friend pumping gas. I leaned out the window to give him the finger and yell at him. If I had just driven off I would have been killed by a guy who ran a red light doing at least 65. Saved by being in butthole. Backcountry skiing in some moderate fog. I thought I knew where I was going until it thickened up a bunch and I realized I really couldn't distinguish terrain features. White snow against a white fog backdrop. I was about to stop to figure out where I was until my eyes locked onto some sharp dark features that just materialized near my feet. I looked down just as I felt this floaty anti-gravity feeling and realized I was was looking at not quite vertical cliff face that I had just lofted off of. I decided to just look like a boss, track out clear of the rocks, and stick the landing after what felt like a 200 meter fall only to have my ski ice bury in snow and just stick. I blew out both bindings and made a face first snow angel in DE powder. I rolled onto my back to admire what was actually only a 8-10 meter fall and laugh my butt off. Comma made a face first snow angel in DE powder. You made Scarface proud. 
When I was a kid I was staying up at some family friend's hobby farm. Me and their boy Sean, we were both around 11 or 12, got up and I gave him a hand doing his chores on the farm. As we walked up to the barn we hear a big commotion in the chicken cooperative. As we walked up to the coop I noticed motion in the chicken wired 2x6 window. Me and Sean are standing 15 feet away from the coop window. I verified with Sean later that we both saw a man appear on the right side of the window. As he floated, or possibly rollerbladed, by the window he slowly looked over at us. And as if finding us wanting turned away and continued out of sight. I will never forget the look on that face. It was the face of an old man who was bloated and severely ill. Unfortunately it was a face that seemed very familiar. Both me and Sean thought it was his father. His father at the time was a healthy and fit 45 year old. But we were both left with the impression that we had seen his father. Anyways, we rush up to the coop to see what's going on. Nothing there except agitated chickens doing their thing. Me and Sean talked about it for the rest of the day and could make no sense of it. His dad had been gone running errands since 5am and didn't return until later that afternoon. Me and Sean never talked about it after that day. In hindsight I can see it became taboo. I fell out of touch with Sean as I got older until I got a call from my parents to let me know that Sean's dad had passed away from cancer and gave me info on his service. The service was at the old hobby farm. Being there brought back a lot of memories but I'm sure I wasn't thinking about me and Sean's spooky incident. My brain had filed that under miscellaneous long ago and forgot about it. Right up until I saw a certain picture in a collection of images from Sean's father's life. The picture that caught my eye was one taken a few weeks before he passed. There he was holding his newly born granddaughter and I guran fkntu he was the same man I saw looking over at me and Sean that happily forgotten day from our childhoods. No doubt about it. When I saw the face I was immediately transported back to that moment. All the smells and doubts and fears. I guess that's it. I am agnostic and loathe superstition and am no means wish to contribute to it, but this did happen to me. I live in NYC and work the graveyard shift. I get out about 4-5 am every night. So I'm on the subway and I jump on the one train and there is this guy sitting alone with a fedora and a trench coat. We're the only two in the car. I look at him right before I step on and we make eye contact. His eyes are bloodshot and crossed and I hesitate right before getting on and he notices clearly. I get on anyway and walk down to the complete opposite side of the car. I'm bigger than him. He's a small fat, pale white, middle aged bald guy. But he is just staring me down and hasn't taken his hands out of his pockets. He has his eyes locked on me and it's making me uncomfortable so I just turn and start staring at him, thinking he might look away quickly. Instead, he stands up. I immediately stand up too and we are just standing at either end of the car looking at each other. As we're pulling up to the next stop, I walk up to the door like I'm getting off. The car stops and the doors open. Still no one in sight. And I jump off the train. He jumps off too. I wait for the ding the doors make before closing and jump back in right as they close. He doesn't make it. As the train starts to pull out this guy just stares me down through the glass. I wave goodbye with a big crap eating grin. TL. DR. Had a staring contest with a cross eyed freak in the NYC subway at 4am. That was your arch nemesis. You just missed out on the most epic battle of the century. I was in Flax, an art store in SF, getting supplies, and this guy was following me around the store. I decided it was time to split, and he followed me to the checkout line, and all the way to my car. I was 21 at the time and there were no cell phones back then, amazingly, so I was on my own. So this guy starts talking about the machines in his head and how the government is following him. Crazy stuff like that. But here's the thing. I come from a crazy family. I know crazy. He wasn't crazy. My best idea for defense was to use all those FBI techniques I have gleaned from watching too many cop shows, and be crazier than he was. I started stepping closer to him, and never broke eye contact. I raised my voice when I spoke and was really excited when we had something in common. I said I wanted to get to know him better, and where did he live? I could visit him. He said some homeless shelter in the address. And I got really excited and said I knew exactly where that was. I could visit him on Thursday. He ended up backing up throughout the conversation. And at one point asked, why are you talking to me? I looked away, wistfully, and said, not many people talk to me. 
You know, this is all a totally true story. I've never done it again thank goodness. But he left scared. I went home safely. Victory for me. Oh my god. That was beautiful. Remind me to do this next time I have someone creepy trying to talk to me. One up is her creepiness. If it makes any difference, I will preface this by saying that I'm female. That fact may or may not make the following creepier. I used to live next to an eye hospital. One day, walking home, I was stopped by an old man who clearly had trouble seeing. He asked me to help him across the road to the hospital. I agreed, and he grabbed hold of my hand very tightly. At this point I noticed his fingers were stained brown from tobacco, covered in scabs, and his fingernails were very long and dirty. I started to think that my good deed for the day would be a bit regrettable. When we got to the other side of the road he still had my hand grasped so tightly I couldn't politely pull away. Do you want to see my eye he said. One of his eyes was squeezed shut. With his free hand he pulled the lids apart and I realized to my horror that he had no eyeball just an empty socket. I started babbling, still trying to be polite, about how that was very interesting, but I had to go. Then he uttered the immortal words. Do you want to put your finger in there he was pulling really hard on my hand trying to force my fingers into his empty eye socket. At this point I gave up on politeness and struggled my hand free. It was difficult. He was really strong. And just ran for it. I could hear him laughing as I ran off. TL. DR. Stranger tried to force me to put my fingers in his empty eye socket. So many many years ago I worked the night shift at a 7 stroke 11 in a neighborhood right next to a bad neighborhood. Until about 2 in the morning we had a security guard. But he didn't even carry a gun. From 2 until 5 you were on your own. After I was hired I found out this particular 7 stroke 11 had been robbed a few times and when family members I knew found out I was working there they tried to convince me to quit. Well as I work nights I slept during the day and one evening I woke up from this very intense dream where I was shot. It was so intense I woke up sweating with this feeling that I was punched in the chest. I decided to quit that day. Well about a week later I go in to collect my paycheck and there's a new guy working the late shift. Seemed alright. I spoke to him for a moment and I left. I found out that the next night he was shot in the chest while working and died in the hospital. Okay, I got contacts around the time I turned 21, and I had a real phobia of putting things in my eyes. If you live in the US, you know that they won't let you leave the ophthalmologist with your first pair of contacts unless you can put them in at least one time. It took me having to come back three days in a row before I could get it right. That's how disturbed I was about it, but I was determined to have contacts. Anyways, I was real careful about rubbing my eyes with them in, because I had this paranoid fear that I would grind them into my eyes. I know, I know. Like I said, I had a real phobia. So, I go to take a bath, and I'm real careful about getting soap in my eyes. Finally, I wash my hair and close my eyes as I douse water on my head. I rub my eyes and open them, and... I realize I'm blind. I can see absolutely nothing. I was in a state of sheer terror. I got incredibly still, and all the possibilities were going through my head. How was I going to get out of the bathtub without help? Was this permanent? How was I going to live my life blind? Then the lights came back on. In the 5 seconds when I had closed my eyes, the power had gone off, and since the bathroom had no window, I'd been in pitch darkness. TL. DR. I briefly thought I had gone blind, but it was just a power outage. Hug. I must have been but 11 when my family was headed down to a neighborhood pool party. My mom and I were bringing a dish inside while my brothers, unbeknownst to my mother, went down to the pool and hopped in. It was crowded in the pool, and wasn't shallow enough for my brothers to stand. They were drowning right there next to everybody. They weren't even 5 or 6 yet. My mom walked out onto the pool deck looking for them and was shouting as she ran to the pool side and everything was panicked and oh my god adrenaline crying breathing crying. It's terrifying when anybody that you love, or any child for that matter, suddenly goes missing or is in danger like that. My first job was working at a gas station. One night when business lulled after rush hour, a car drove up and the man inside it asked me for directions to a restaurant. I started giving him directions and he asked me to come closer because he couldn't hear very well over the noise from the street. I thought it was reasonable, so I took a couple steps closer to his car. 
As I was explaining how to get to the restaurant from the gas station the man interrupted me and said you have the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. I'd like to put them in a jar on my desk so I can look at them all day. The guy I was working with quickly yanked me away from the man's car and told the creep that he needed to leave or the cops would be called. What's the scariest thing you've woken up to in the middle of the night? I woke up to sound of scampering raccoon-like creature inside my room zooming about the night before Christmas. It then bounced on my bed jumped off and ran out. Raccoon sized. I followed it and it was laying on the couch and barked at me adorably. Apparently my parents got my sister a puppy and it had escaped during the night because it was lonely. They had it in an uncovered puppy kennel in the living room and he climbed out. The interesting thing is he didn't like my older sister and instead clung to me and he became my dog when she moved out and couldn't take him. Best friend to this day. Possibly the best story outcome here. Went to bed at midnight. Woke up in searing pain at 2am. Such grave pain that I thought my appendix had burst. Flipped on the lights to take a Tylenol only to find I had rolled over on a black widow spider that had bit me. My son has had a scout since he was born. It's this green dog that plays music and speaks when you press his paw. And you can program it to say your child's name. He also speaks in a young child's voice. Since my son was an infant at the time, all his toys were pretty much contained to our living room as he wasn't crawling yet. Every night before we went to bed, we would put his toys away in a wicker basket that we had beside our entertainment system. I distinctly remember putting Scout back in the basket. I woke up at 2 in the morning to Scout's voice under my bed, saying do you want to play, son's name? I was halfway to my son's room to get him and get the frick away from that haunted butt toy before my brain turned on and I realized that my cat had dragged Scout under our bed and was currently humping the crap out of it. Freaking cats, man. My dinkus neighbor was drunk and thought my apartment was his. He broke the lock on my door. He then opened up the door to my bedroom and scared the crap out of me at 1am. I screamed and he apologized profusely and asked if I wanted to drink Modelo with him and his wife at their house. There had been a baptism so everyone was partying it up across the way. I went because they're nice. And they had tamales. My freaking friend standing over me in the middle of the night while sleeping at his place. Mother scared the life out of me. I'm sure there were worse things. But one time when I was a kid, my parents placed a full body shaped Elmo balloon in my room while I was sleeping. Ever woken up to a floating body? Same thing happened to me when I was asleep except the balloon was dying and the central air herded it downstairs. It was a big smiley balloon and it woke me up when the string slithered across my face. I have yet to ever be that petrified in my life. Sleeping at home. Alone. I woke up one night when I rolled over and someone else's limp arm flopped across my chest. I freaked out, grabbed the arm, flung it away, and tried to scramble out of bed before realizing that it was my own arm. It had completely lost all feeling up to the shoulder. I woke up at 1am to a hand touching my boob. Next thing I know, I'm flailing about in an attempt to stop the would-be assaulter, only to realize that my arm was numb. I also managed to knock over everything in arm's reach and slap myself in the face. Daughter had this mini mouse baby doll that crawled on all fours when you touched a button on its back. Wife and I woke up at 2am to the sound of the doll's creepy laugh. Went out to the living room and the doll was walking straight into the corner. Each time it stopped it would just start right over again. The button wasn't broken or anything, so I'm not sure what happened. Donated it. Buried would have been more appropriate. Someone standing in the bedroom doorway. He flipped on the light then flipped it off. I woke my husband up and this guy walked out of the apartment. My husband ran out after him in his underwear. I went to the kitchen and got a knife and ran after my husband. Turns out, the woman who lived there before us had broken up with her boyfriend and moved without telling him or getting back his key. I guess he came back to see her, at 3 in the morning. I used to live a few minutes away from Bunsfield oil storage facility. It was the 5th largest oil depot in the UK. On the morning of the 11th of December 2005 it exploded. The explosion threw me out of my bed, and the doors of our house burst open. I looked outside my bedroom window and the sky was engulfed by a giant fireball 11 year old me genuinely thought it was the end of the world. It still baffles me as to how no one died during that incident.
Dang. I'd have nightmares about that for years. I got up to go to the bathroom, and didn't turn my bedroom light on so I didn't see that anything was amiss. When I got to the toilet, I suddenly realized that my hands were covered in blood up to my elbows. It wasn't dripping wet but it wasn't dry either. I didn't have any cuts or seem to have any injury of any kind. When I washed my hands I checked everywhere. No injury. What the heck was happening? When I went back to my bedroom I turned the light on, and half of my pillow was covered in blood as well, almost exactly down the middle. It was then that I realized I'd gotten a nosebleed and been wiping at it in my sleep, and it must have stopped just before I woke up so I didn't have any clue left on my body as to where I'd bled from. I was living in a very dry area at the time, so nosebleeds were a common issue for me. That's the only time I've gotten one during my sleep though. Open up. Police. We have a search warrant. It was about 6am, accompanied by banging that was loud as crap. Turns out it was for the apartment beneath my bedroom window but I sat straight up and my first thought was, oh no, they got me despite being one of the least shady people alive. They heard about you rebroadcasting NFL games to your friends with only implied written consent of the NFL. Oh, they'll be coming for you next. Exploding head syndrome alternately termed episodic cranial sensory shock, is a benign condition in which a person experiences unreal noises that are loud and short, like a bomb exploding or a gunshot, when falling asleep or waking up. These noises are often jarring and frightening for the person. Neither the cause nor the mechanism is known, though harmless in and of themselves, episodes have been known to create distress or impairment in the lives of individuals. It happens to me once or twice a year. It keeps things interesting. Housemaid coming home drunk after midnight from a Halloween party dressed as Jason from Friday 13th. Walked into my room by mistake in his full view his costume and just stood in the middle of the room looking around trying to work out where he was. Woke me up as my door opened and I was frozen terrified for a good 30 seconds. Bought a lock for my door the following week. I live w my oldest sister and her two daughters. Her youngest, 3 years old, was a sleepwalker. She was tiny, white blonde and liked to wear a white nightgown that was too big for her. Yet, yeah. wake up to the sound of thumb sucking right next to my head, roll over and see the world's shortest ghost. We had a rooster who was pretty aggressive, but he watched the rest of the chickens. He was so aggressive though that only certain people could go near him otherwise he'd attack and spur. For a while he had free reign of our yard, but we had to pin him because he'd attack people. Well. He'd figured out he could sort of halfway fly out and get back into our yard after we'd all gone to sleep. One night we woke up to what sounded like a young girl screaming at the top of their lungs. We ran outside to see what it was and old Bark Bark, his name, was walking around decapitated. He'd picked a fight with a raccoon and lost, but that sound he made that night still haunts my dreams sometimes. Someone slamming on the door of the apartment across the hall screaming your apartment is on fire. It sounded like it was on mine. Woke up and immediately started choking on smoke. The fire alarm then went off. Everything ended up being okay. Someone flicked a cigarette butt off their balcony. It landed on the one a few floors beneath it and set their patio furniture on fire. Hence why someone saw it before the alarm went off. It was just so disorienting and terrifying to wake up to the pounding on the door, the screaming, and the smoke. In late, but ah well. One night I swore I heard a man's voice downstairs. I slowly crept downstairs, found nothing, and went to bed. Next night, again, I swore I heard a man's voice downstairs. Again I crept downstairs and again found nothing. Third night, this time I heard a woman's voice downstairs. Again nothing. Fourth night was a Saturday and I was up super late. And thus was downstairs when I heard my laptop say your virus definitions have been updated. Apparently I'd gotten the Avast update that enabled voice reporting by default and randomized between a male and female voice. Turned that crap off right quick. I've only ever heard the female voice. Still scary as heck though. Fall asleep at the computer. Wake up to a computer be screaming Avast. Virus database has been updated. I was house sitting for friends and I heard their dog bark at like 4 o'clock in the morning. He always barks at passing cars so I told him to shush and settled back down to go to sleep. 
Then I heard voices inside the house. I freaked the frick out. Shouting who is that? Who the frick is there? Luckily it was my friends coming back earlier than they thought they would. The loud sound of breaking glass from downstairs. Husband armed himself and crept downstairs. No intruder. One of the cats knocked over a centerpiece that exploded all over the floor. The clear and obvious sounds of an animal in the bedroom. We had no pets. I'm in the UK so my sleepy brain at first thought it was a rat. Or several rats fighting for their lives. After some minor panicking it turned out to be a pigeon trap behind the boarded up fireplace. Slept on the sofa that night. It was a rat fight club. A mortar alarm while sleeping in a tent in Afghanistan. You have about 30 seconds to get out of bed. Get fully dressed. Get all your gear and weapon and get the frick outside. Pretty crappy especially when you had been up for over 24 hours straight and you get an hour of sleep before being violently woken up. Surprised I had to scroll down this far to find a mention of an IDF alarm. I still hear that crap in my dreams. My daughter had a ring around the rosy doll when she was little. You put the doll's hands together and it would sing the song. Anyway, she left it out outside one night apparently and the dew in the grass shorted it out. I woke up in the middle of the night to this faint ring around the rosy song playing over and over. It was creepy and we didn't have an outdoor light in the backyard so I had to go by myself with a flashlight and search the yard for this creepy doll. I had a Siamese mix cat and one summer it started to sing in the middle of the night. Sounded like a crying baby right in my condo. Freaked me the heck out the first time I heard it. Sounds like my stepmom's cat. Tuxedo cat. That at night would walk around the house meowing. But it sounded exactly like he was saying hello. Hearing the door creak open and that hello is still one of the scariest things I've experienced. Woke up to the feeling of something on my face. Tried to brush it off and in my half asleep state thought it was attacking me. Q absolute freak out because something is crawling all over me and I can't get it off. Just for me to find out it was my own hand that had gone numb while I was asleep. The numb hand strikes again. My neighbors on the east side yelling at me to wake up and get out of my house. The garage on the west side was burning and there was a car inside. They were sure it was going to blow up. When I was young, ish, I woke up to the sound of people quietly moving around downstairs when I believed I was home alone. Crapping myself and still confused from the sleep I grabbed a telescopic wheel brace as the only available weapon. Heart beating out my chest. Fight or flight reflex in full effect when I heard the sound of footsteps up the stairs outside my room. Hand on the door handle and ready to fight for my life. I hear my dad's voice. Immediately realize my parents had got back from holiday earlier than I expected. The endorphin rush was intense. Extreme endorphin rush followed by a whole lot of nothing actually can cause damage to your heart over years. We had a training class at work explaining that after a few years all of our hearts are bruised and we need to take steps to lessen our stress and love healthier lives. We have a window AC unit basically right above our bed. One night, ice must have gotten built up inside. And it fell onto the fan that blows the air out. I remember hearing a loud bang and then being sprayed in the face by liquid. My first thought was that someone broke in and shot my wife and I got covered in blood. Freaking terrifying. One time when my brother was living with my sister, he got home drunk and had locked himself out of the house. The only way to break in was to push in my sister's window AC in her bedroom. She woke up to him trying to shove it through the window and yelled that she had a gun, which she did. My dumbass brother almost got himself shot by his own sister. An earthquake. But you see, I'm no California dweller who would half expect to die in the night on any given evening thanks to unforgiving geological processes. No, I'm in England, and an earthquake was a novel experience for me. I thought a train was approaching my house and even awoke, braced for impact. I was utterly terrified afterwards, as I'd taken the ground solidity and reliability for granted. I got woken up by an earthquake once. I didn't know what it was though and only heard the family sound of bed springs squeaking in my neighbor's apartment so I assumed they were at it again. When my bed started shaking to all I could groggily think was Jesus, he's really pounding her this morning, felt like an idiot when I got the alert on my phone. Heard a sound like low thunder or a big truck coming down the street. Next thing I know whole house starts shaking. 
4 point something earthquake. Not your average occurrence for St. Louis, M.O. Fell asleep on the couch, woke up around 3 a.m. to my cat clawing my face. Every time I tried to go back to sleep, he started again. Finally I got pee off and decided to put him in another room. As soon as I stood up I smelled natural gas. The pilot light on my stove had gone out. Little guy saved my life. Our cat woke us up when the apartment was on fire. The smoke alarms never went off and if not for him we probably would have died. My heart racing so fast, I couldn't breathe. I was in the middle of a supraventricular tachycardia episode. My BPM was 210. Had to go to the ear and get drugs to slow it down. I was absolutely terrified I was going to have a heart attack that night. Scary stuff. Holy crap. I've had tachycardia but never like that. I'd be terrified. Hope things are better now. When I was about 12 I got woken up by a middle of the night phone call which I heard my mom answer. She was told my sister had been in a car accident. It was a bad wreck and one of her friends was killed. Luckily my sister made it but I will never forget the sounds of my mom screaming and crying as her and my dad left for the hospital. I woke up to a bright orange window thinking it was just something strange or that I was just dreaming. Went back to sleep. Woke up again some time later in realization and ran to tell my mother. The neighbor's shed was on fire and our fence and cherry tree were catching fire as well. Still remember standing in the middle of the night looking at the fire and all the ash falling. The neighbors got a cool looking rebuilt shed now. A SWAT team banging on my door responding to hostage situation called in from a cell phone mistakenly registered to my home. The new 911 database apparently had some issues with area codes. They were expecting a knife wielding assailant and instead got me in my robe. I opened the door to 6 assault rifles trained on me. I'm very thankful their trigger discipline was good. Even when I shouted an alarm. The flip side is that someone else was having an even worse night, when their 911 call that had to be automatically traced because they couldn't talk to the dispatcher failed to result in the needed response. This is my favorite story to tell. I'm absolutely terrified of a home invasion type of situation. I'll blame it on the copious amounts of true crime podcasts I listen to. So, when I'm home alone I constantly check the locks and sleep with a knife next to my bed. Husband goes out of town for two nights. First night all is good. Second night I check the doors, lock my bedroom door and go to sleep. Well, I wake up at around 3am to the sound of the door rattling a bit. My first instinct is that it's one of the cats pawing at the door wanting out. But after I've fully woken up I realize it's someone trying to twist the doorknob. I completely freeze. Heart is racing. And I slowly reach for the light switch. I then start to think that maybe I don't want them to know I'm awake by turning the light on. So that maybe I can hide or grab my knife. Our indoor doorknobs if you twist them hard enough will just pop open. So I finally hear it click and the door just barely opens about 5 inches. I can see the outline of a man standing there just barely lit from behind from moonlight coming in the living room sliding door. So I'm just sitting there in this frozen position with my arm halfway reaching for the light and the other half reaching for the knife for what feels like an eternity. He just stands there, staring in the door and I'm convinced I'm about to be murdered. And then the door opens a little bit more, and the man's outline starts to become more clear. I manage to just barely whisper my husband's name, and hear back yeah, why is the door locked this butthole? Had decided that the friend he was sharing a hotel with was snoring too loud and drove home 4 hours in the middle of the night. I once woke up from a nightmare and was still half asleep. Thought I saw some kind of a person sitting at the corner of my bed and I wasn't able to move or scream. Because still half asleep at that point. When I finally was awake enough to move I tried to smash that person and then realized I still was dreaming. Tried to get asleep after this happened but wasn't able to because of the adrenaline I received. I think this was my worst night and most scariest thing I ever woke up at the middle of the night. I had stumbled downstairs to get some water from the tap at about 2am. I look out of the window directly in front of, of me and stare into pitch darkness you can't see anything more than a few feet. Turn the tap off. Look up and there's a dude's face just staring back at me. He's so close he's practically got his nose to the glass. A face that makes Gollum look like a model. This guy is obviously a serial killer. At least that's what my sleep-addled mind was thinking. 
I crap myself and just keep staring. He is also crapping himself and keeps staring. Until he starts pointing. He is pointing at the outside tap. He's pointing at the outside tap because he is a homeless dude who is getting water for himself and his friends who have started living in the woods nearby. He smiles at me. This black toothed grin so I smile back and nod. He fills his water bottles and buggers off back to the woods. Over the next few months I got to know them all and they were super nice. They'd come for water and I'd leave them little care packages of food until they moved on to somewhere else. Presumably to scare the crap out of someone else in the middle of the night. TLDR. Went to get water. A madman's face appears at the window out of the darkness. Turns out he's a homeless guy after water and not a murderer. So starts a beautiful, bit brief, relationship. I was fully expecting it to be your reflection. When my daughter was an infant we had one of those heart monitors on her foot at night. Apparently the thing will occasionally throw a false red alert alarm. Randomly. Even though nothing is wrong. It happened twice. You go from full, REM, dead to the world sleep to adrenaline pumping, flight or fight response in 05 seconds. I do not recommend it. About a year ago I was woken up at 4.30am by someone walking into my apartment. I live alone. Oddly, after the first split second WTF startle, I wasn't at all scared. I guess I just sensed there was no danger. Turned out to be the wasted hookup of the guy in the apartment downstairs from me. She had taken his keys to go out for a smoke, then forgotten what floor he lived on. And my cheap landlord had reused a matching set of front and back door locks on two separate apartments, so they had the same key. She was so disoriented and way more freaked out than I was. I ended up escorting her to the right apartment, and then she asked me for a hug. I have a new lock now. Then there was the time I woke up to the sound and shockwaves of a bomb blast destroying a nearby abortion clinic. But that's a different story. That, that different story please. I have an electronic door lock. Late one night, I heard the beeps from the lock over and over and over. Four beeps every time. I grabbed my phone and checked ring.com. No one there. I went out on my balcony and the beeping continued. I finally pinpointed it. Effing mockingbird learned my lock tones and scared the crap out of me. Had a mockingbird in my yard that learned to make the sound of my obnoxious late 70s era G alarm clock. Well wouldn't be so bad if the bastard didn't do it an hour before I wanted to get up all the time. My wife punched me in the goods while I was sound asleep. When I woke up screaming she woke up too and was unsure why I was hysterical. She said she was fighting someone in a dream. After my son was born, my fatherly instincts kicked into overdrive. One uncharacteristically quiet night, I heard someone trying to break into our house. Without a word I jumped out of bed, ran out the bedroom, like the ultimate warrior, down the hall, past the kitchen, through the living room, to the front door. I burst through the front door to find, our neighbors had ordered a pizza. I woke up to someone whistling a really sad tune outside. At first it was distant but... It got louder as it came closer and eventually stopped right under my bedroom window. The person stayed there for at least 10 minutes and I was scared shitless. I didn't dare peek through the blinds. The next morning I checked the yard. Sure enough, there were footprints in the dirt under my window. I never figured it out and I don't really want to. This is terrifyingly unnerving. My cat giving birth on the corner of my bed. E. Apparently 100 other people have had this happen. Who knew having cats as pets was so common. My sister woke up in the middle of the night to her cat giving birth on top of her. Freshman year in college the room next to me had some serious sexual olympics going on. Said olympics were interrupted by an angry boyfriend kicking the door in. He proceeded to beat the crap out of both of them. Her screams were something I will never forget. You would think I would have gone and tried to stop him from attacking them but I just froze and listened. The three responses are flight, fight and freeze. It's okay to freeze up. It happens to a lot of people. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video.
bye for now.